Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. And tonight, I bring you a special radio serial starring two horror legends, Vincent Price and Peter Cushing. It's a six-part radio serial called Aliens in the Mind. Aliens in the Mind originated from an initial concept for the television series Doctor Who, conceived by the show's script editor Robert Holmes. While not selected for production within the series, Holmes was tasked with refining the concept for Radio 4. Due to prior commitments, the scripts were ultimately penned by someone else, drawing from Holmes' original concept. This six-part drama unfolds on a secluded Scottish island, where a community of human mutants possessing telepathic abilities is discovered. A sinister plot emerges to manipulate these individuals in an attempt to influence the British government. Allies Curtis Lark, played by Vincent Price, and Hugh Baxter, portrayed by Peter Cushing, unite to thwart this malevolent scheme. It originally aired on BBC Radio 4 in 1977. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, plus you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness Retro Radio. Aliens in the Mind Co-starring Vincent Price as Professor Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius much as it hath pleased Almighty God to take unto himself the soul of our brother. We commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes. In the sure hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, honey. Okay, that's that then. Well, we'll be missing him, Doogie. Okay. The doctor. Twenty years he's been with us. Aye. Do you know that fellow at the graveside? I've never seen him before. Oh, I don't doubt we'll know him soon enough. Aye. The minister's awaited him already. Old Donald School has not wanted to let a stranger pass his gate. Part one. Island Genesis. Good day to you, sir. I'm Donald Schooler, the minister here. And you'd be... John Cornelius. Uh -huh. 
A relative of the doctor's, maybe? No, just a friend. A very old friend. And have you travelled far? From London. I had hoped to be here for the inquest. Uh, that was this morning. Accidental death, of course. Tragic. Yes. Could you tell me how he... I mean, I, I read that he fell from a cliff. I uh, last Friday night. Uh, there was a heavy fog over the island. We get a lot of it coming in from the sea at this time of the year. It seems he wandered off the cliff path. He was found at the foot of Drochna Head, 460 feet. I see. You uh, know there's no boat back to the mainland until tomorrow. Oh, yes, but I'm told there's an inn. Oh, oh no, you're welcome to stay at the manse. Well, that's, that's very kind of you, Not I... at all, I insist. Well, thank you. Hi, Mary, my housekeeper. We'll be glad to see a new face around the place. Mary! Is that you, Minister? We have a guest, Mary, Mr. Oh. Cornelius. I'm glad to meet you. An old friend of the doctor's. Oh, it's a sad day, sir. He was such a, a fine man. Uh, Mr. Cornelius can have the front guest room, Mary, can he not? Aye. Is that all you have with you, just the one wee bag? It's quite adequate, I assure you. Ah, well, leave it with Mary, Mr. Cornelius. Thank you. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll way up and uh, give the room an airing. Now, you'll take a wee dram, just to warm you. A little whiskey would be most welcome, thank you. Oh, uh, sit yourself down, Mr. Cornelius. Make yourself at home. That's most kind. Thank you. Was it uh, long since you'd seen him, the doctor? We must be three or four years, I suppose. We wrote occasionally and kept promising to meet, but with the distance and pressure of work, well, you know how it is. I, I, I can well imagine. Ah, here. Thank you. And here's a health for you. God bless. And had you been uh, corresponding lately uh, with the doctor? No, I haven't heard from him for quite a while. Ah, oh, that's better. And he was your oldest friend, you see. Well, one of them. We were inseparable in the old days, you and I and a man called Curtis Lark. Curtis Lark? <laughs> that's rather a quaint name. Rather a quaint man, I suppose. American, of course. Mm. The three of us were together at the same hospital. You're not free from aircraft noise, even up here, Mr. Schooler. Oh, a helicopter from the naval training station. It's not usual for them to fly so low. Uh, since you were at the same hospital, I take it you are also a, a medical man? Yes. Uh, should I not be addressing you as Dr. Cornelius, then? No, I'm a surgeon. Ah, uh -huh. uh, you'd be a, a specialist of some sort. Oh, yes, I'm a brain surgeon. Didn't you have a housekeeper? Uh, Molly Kyle, aye. Oh, a fine woman. Uh, she was at the service. Do you think she'd mind if I went up to the house? I'm sure she'd expect it. Uh, why not now? Before, uh, before it gets dark. I'd be glad to walk you over there myself. Oh, that's very kind of you, Minister. Come along then, Mr Cornelius. Oh, uh, if you could just wait a moment, I'd better tell Mary we're going out. Certainly. I'll be outside stretching my legs. Half fast. Hmm. Two minutes slow. What the devil? Oh, no. Oh, please, no. My poor child, what is the matter? She's calling them. She's calling them again. Calling who, my dear? The fellowship. She's calling them away from the fire. Oh, stop her. Stop her or they'll die too. Who will die? Who will die? You will. Come here, my dear. What is your name? Laura! Laura, come inside at once! Oh, no, Minister! I'm all right! I'm not hearing her voice! I'm not! I'm not! I'm sorry, Mr. Cornelius. I hope Laura wasn't bothering you. This seems to be one of her bad days. What's wrong with her? Sick in the head, I'm afraid. Mental disorientation, the doctor called it. Is she receiving any treatment? 
prayer and faith in the Lord is the best possible treatment, Mr. Cornelius. Many of the young folk on Lewig come here troubled in spirit, and within a year or so, they're completely cured. That's why their parents send them to me. Really? Are you a faith healer, then? No, Mr. Cornelius. I am just the shepherd to my flock. Now, shall we walk across to the doctor's house? Please. It's just a few minutes over the headland. This is Drochna Head, Mr. Cornelius. Was it here that Hugh fell? Ah, down on those rocks. Seems rather a long way to have strayed from the path. Twenty-four feet, according to the coroner. Ooh, he must have walked this way hundreds of times. I mean, you'd have thought... Uh, that... It was quite a fog we had that night. Even so, the path here is worn to the bare rock. But the moment you stray towards the edge, it's all grass, thick grass. He was drunk, Mr. Cornelius. It wasn't said at the inquest, of course, but everyone here is of the opinion that poor Dr. Dexter had taken a drop too much that night. That doesn't sound a bit like you. Hey, wait, what's that? What, where? Down there, on the beach. You see? Oh, yes, there is someone down there. Ah, he's taking the cliff path up towards the doctor's house. Come along. We'll no doubt run into him further along. Ah, here we are. Much bigger than I expected. Ah, this was his surgery, a dispensary, and the living quarters as well. Oh, hello, Minister. Hello, Molly. Oh, this is Mrs. Kyle. Good afternoon, Mrs. Kyle. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Mr. Cornelius Molly. He was a friend of the doctor's. Oh, I. Hello there. What? And who is this now? Good Lord, it's Curtis Lark. Where on earth did he spring from? Hello, John. How are you? I'm fine, but how did you get here? <sighs> by passenger jet, private charter plane, and finally by one of your Royal Navy's helicopters. Am I in time? Not for Hugh's funeral, if that's what you mean. Well, I did try, but I was in wildest Borneo when I got the news. Ah. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me introduce you. Professor Curtis Lark, the minister, the Reverend Donald Schooler. Professor. And Mrs. Kyle, Hugh's housekeeper. Hello. Uh, will you not come inside, gentlemen? Oh, thank you. After you, John. Go straight into the study, yeah. if you would. If you would excuse me, Molly. Aye. You'll be wanting to get back for the fellowship meeting. Fellowship? The fellowship of the Kirk. Oh. I'll see you later then, Minister. Aye, back at the manse. Good day to you, Professor. A bien too, Minister. Hmm. Early Edwardian walnut. Hardly Hugh's taste, I would have thought. If it's the furniture you're talking about, he bought it with the practice. It used to belong to old Dr Mingis before... Uh, there's a picture over here that you'll maybe recognise. Oh, yes, the class photograph. I think you're both there on it somewhere. The second row left with Hugh standing between us. Look. I can still remember the day when it was taken. Oh, was it really 20 years ago? No, it was nearer 30. Oh, my goodness. Well, all things considered, we still look remarkably young. All things considered, Curtis, you probably need glasses. Oh, we're none of us getting any younger, sir. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Kyle, did you, I mean, did the doctor ever wear glasses? Aye. He had a pair made last year, just for reading, you know. What time was it when the doctor went out last Friday? I wasn't here that night, sir. I was over to the mainland to visit relatives. Oh, I see so you wouldn't know if he had been drinking at all? No, sir. I'm afraid not. Uh-huh. Uh, can I get you gentlemen something to eat? Oh, that's an excellent idea. I had breakfast somewhere, but I've quite forgotten where or even when it oh, was. you <laughs> must be starved. Right. I'll away to see to it now. Oh, thank you. You're most kind. Oh, dear, dear John, I can't tell you how glad I am to see you again. My dear fellow, I'm glad to see you too, and surprised. Surprised? I'm astonished. It's less than a week since Hugh's death was announced. It's quite incredible that you managed to get here from, where was it? The wilds of Borneo? John, I, I wasn't in Borneo. Oh? No, that was just for the minister's benefit. Ah. I'd <laughs> left Borneo two days before on my way here. And when I heard the news of Hugh's death, I was actually making a stopover in Sydney, Australia. You see, I received this letter from Hugh, 
Uh, look, you'd better read it here. Oh, thank you. <clears throat> My dear Curtis, please read this scribble indulgently because it's extremely difficult for an island vegetable like me to keep a steady leaf between lines, eh? Well, it doesn't make sense. Oh, yes, it does. Don't you remember that silly code we devised when we suspected that horse-faced matron of opening our mail? Oh, good Lord, yes. Let me see now. Uh, first two, wasn't it? Right. First two and last two words in every sentence. That's right. Now you try it again. Ah, I know. Please read and the last two. Between lines. Right. A terrible danger here. You must help me. Message end. A terrible danger here. It's as though he knew he was going to die. And who was going to kill him? You can't be serious. Well, he obviously thought his mail was being intercepted. You can't suspect the postman. I don't even know the postman. Well, then. And I hardly know Mrs. Kyle any better. Oh, no, that's preposterous. Well, someone was checking Hugh's mail. It doesn't follow that they killed him. Or indeed that anyone killed him. John... I found this pair of glasses on the beach. Show them to me. They're reading glasses. Oh, I can see that, but they're not necessarily Hughes. Well, they were just about where his body would have been. Well, surely they would have been in a case. Hugh certainly had a case for them, John. Look, it's right there on the desk. Empty. But it still doesn't prove anything. Not in a court of law, perhaps. But it's proof enough for me... You can't really believe that Hugh, or anyone else for that matter, would walk along a dangerous clifftop at night in thick fog with a pair of reading glasses stuck on his nose. It's just not possible. According to the minister, the general opinion is that Hugh was drunk that night. John, that's not possible either. Why? Well, he swore off liquor the night his wife died. Besides, I've seen the autopsy report. When? I made a courtesy call on the coroner earlier today before I arranged for the helicopter to bring me over. But that's not allowed. I know, I know. I think perhaps he was overwhelmed by my medical reputation. I'm amazed. Perhaps we could come to the point, Curtis? The point, my dear John, is that according to the autopsy report, there was absolutely no trace of alcohol in the body. Not in the stomach, not in the blood, not in the urine. None whatsoever. Hmm. Curiouser and curiouser. Gosh, if we could only... If we could only find something positive. What did you have in oh, mind? I don't know. Some notes, a diary, a letter he never dared send. Anything. But where do we start to look? Well, presumably where no one else would think of looking. You think he hid something? I certainly hope so. I would have done it in his place. Oh, yes, I'm sure you would. But don't just stand there, John. Try those filing cabinets. Oh, very well. Nothing much in the desk. I'll try these cupboards over here. Just medical reports here. What you'd expect, really. Hey, there's a cassette recorder in here. I thought Hugh was a hi-fi man. Well, he was. I can't imagine what sort of music he had... Oh. Scottish folk music, sea chanties, the Boston Pops. Never. Oh, no, definitely not his scene. If he had wanted light relief, he would have chosen Vivaldi or Scarletti. And certainly not on a cassette. He was too much of a purist. Oh. Let's move it on a bit. No, 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 not far enough yet. I've recorded there this we are. message for John Cornelius consultant surgeon to the London Encephalic Hospital, or for Professor Curtis Lark of the New York Institute of Paranormal Phenomena. I must admit from the start that all my research records disappeared when my study was burgled earlier in the year. Construe that how you will. All that now remains is a notebook of my observations, which I have lodged for safekeeping with our old friend, Ward Locke. Who? Well, do you know anyone named Locke? I don't. The only Locke I know had the misfortune to be an encyclopedia. What are you talking about? Ward Locke's medical encyclopedia. John, you're a genius, an unsung genius. Yes, but we tend not to sing about it on this side of the Atlantic, you know. <laughs> Locke, Locke, Locke. 
Lux. That black tome, dear boy, over on the left there. Ah, ah here it is. Lux Medical Encyclopedia. Oh, do open it, Curtis. It won't bite you. Well, look at that. A hollow's been cut into the center of the pages. Yes, but what's inside? His notebook. What else? Ah. Uh-huh. I've just returned Maud Lock to, as you would say, his appointed place in the order of things. Yes, but you'd better let me have that notebook. You're always losing things. I'll put it in my pocket. Damn it, I've even lost the playback button on this infernal machine. All right. All right. There we are. If you can find time to contact Ward Lock, you will see that my observations have led me to believe that this island is in the throes of giving birth to a new race. A mutant species. Physically, they are human, but my EEGs suggest that their brain is quite different from ours. I know for a fact that they are capable of some form of telepathy. It is the development of this telepathic power during early adolescence that is directly responsible for the high incidence of mental disorientation among the younger people on the island. Almost invariably, the clinical symptoms in these cases seem to disappear within about a year. Schoolers, prayer and faith in the Lord. What's that supposed to mean? The minister cures them, or so he claims. The island of sickness, he calls it. What Hugh's describing sounds more like an an island genesis. Yes, I know. Look, switch it on again. All right. The single exception to this rule is a girl whose development seems to have been arrested in the middle of her own personal metamorphosis, as it were, so that she retains all the disorientation symptoms. Logically, one would have expected a complementary arrest in the development of her brain, but her EEG suggests that her brain may in fact be better developed than anyone else's. She has proved able, on occasions, to disrupt the telepathic communication of other mutants. And this is what frightens me. To implant her own thoughts in their minds. It is my belief that she may be a second phase mutant, the prototype of a genetically selected master race. Her name is Flora Keary. Pray God she is only the prototype. If there are others like her, the whole future of mankind, as we know it, could be threatened. My God. Well, at least we know why Hugh died. Doctor oh. Dexter. Mrs. Kyle. I, I, I thought I heard the doctor. Well, you did, Mrs. Kyle. But it was only a tape recording. Sit down, Mrs. Kyle. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you very much. <sighs> well, I can understand it. It must have given you quite a turn. Uh, look, you'd better drink this. Hmm? Thank you. Oh, oh. Oh, what a nasty taste. Well, it shouldn't be. It said pure malt on the label. Go on, drink it up. Oh, my heart's still pounding. I, I just... Wasn't expecting it, you know. You rest for the moment. You'll soon feel better. Yes, now look, Uh, this will help you to relax. eh? I'm feeling quite dizzy now. No, 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 don't get up. Uh, Don't get up. Just rest there. Oh, oh. the poor woman's fainted. It must be the shock. Oh, don't be an ass, John. I slipped her what is euphemistically known as a Mickey Finn. A Mickey... (laughs) There's no smell. What on earth was it? There was a curare derivative. Out in Borneo, there's a tribe of headhunters who use it as a local anaesthetic. Very interesting, John, but hardly relevant. Unless you intend taking Mrs. Kyle's head as a trophy. (laughs) No, but she may intend taking mine, or yours, for that matter. Let's be quite clear about our situation, John. Hugh was killed, presumably by mutants, because he knew too much about them. If they discover how much we know, we won't have a snowball's chance in hell of getting off this island alive. But you surely don't suspect Mrs. Kyle of being a mutant? Until such time as we learn how to distinguish mutants from non-mutants, I intend, in the interest of self-preservation, to suspect everyone on this island of being a mutant. Curtis, I met a girl called Flora earlier today Uh at the manse, the minister's house. She was about 18, I should think. Well past the age of puberty, anyway. Uh, She had all the symptoms of the case that you spoke of. The second phase mutant. It could be. 
Uh, where are you off to now? To the manse, of course. That girl's our only lead. Uh, what about Mrs. Kyle? Oh, she'll sleep it off in about a half hour or so. Are you coming? Uh, just collecting the cassette? Uh, very good thinking, my dear John. Thank you. Right. Now let's go. I'm coming. Look, Curtis. Something's going on in the church. The lights are on. Must be some sort of service. The fellowship meeting. Yes, that's right. The minister mentioned it. So did Flora. She says something about calling them away from the fire. What fire? I don't know. Well, then I think it's time we found out. Come on. John, give me a leg up. Hmm? I want to do a little surreptitious eavesdropping. Steady, John, steady. You're overweight, damn it. All those hot dogs. Well, let me down. It's the greatest of pleasure. There are rows and rows of them in there, just sitting there like so many zombies. Listen. Servants of the devil, his work is Satan's handiwork. Should be cast into outer darkness. All unto everlasting hellfire. Those people make the Spanish Inquisition sound like a parlor game. Well, if the devil's handiwork were consumed in eternal hellfire, and I would not move from the house of God to save it. Hey. And the ashes should be cast. Curtis, there's a fire up there on the hill. Ooh, what a fire. It looks like the whole house has gone up in flames. Hugh's house? Yes. I've just remembered something, what? Curtis. When I talked to Flora, she said that if I didn't stop her calling them away from the fire, I'd die too. You? I didn't understand at the time, but I do now. They wanted us to be in that house. And they would just sit there in their church and let us quietly burn to death. <laughs> what? No, who's, who's that? Flora, what are you doing here? Waiting for her to die. Her? Mrs. Kyle. She's up there in that inferno, probably still unconscious. No, she's awake now. Flora, what's going on in the church? She is calling them. Calling them to the fire. Listen. Save me. Save me. Oh my God, something wrong. Why didn't they go? Because I was telling them to stay. But why, Flora? Why? Because now Luik is mine. <laughs> Luik is mine. <laughs> so Mrs. Kyle was a second phase mutant too. You realize what that means? Yes, it it means that Flora isn't just a prototype. Hugh's so-called master race has, has been with us for at least 50 years. 50 years? Three generations? And God said, go forth and multiply.
That was part one of Aliens in the Mind, co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius, with Henry Stamper as Donald Schooler, Sandra Clark, Flora Keary, Shirley Dixon, Mrs. Kyle, Irene Sutcliffe, Mary, and Fraser Carr, Dr. Hugh Dexter. Aliens in the Mind was written by René Basilico from an idea by Robert Holmes. Production by John Dias. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or so-bad-it's-good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching. And our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. Aliens in the Mind. Co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius. On the remote Scottish Isle of Lewig, Lark and Cornelius are convinced that the death of their friend Dr. Hugh Dexter was no accident. From his research notes, they diagnose the island sickness as early symptoms of a strange genetic mutation, affecting many of the island's inhabitants, turning them into zombies, blindly obeying orders from an unknown source. The key to the mystery seems to be an apparently simple-minded 18-year-old girl, Flora Curie, who saves them from burning to death in a fire that destroys Dr. Dexter's house, and with it, the housekeeper, Molly Kyle. Let's get burned. No! No! We must go! I'm coming out! Do not move! Do not move! Why didn't they go? Because I was telling them to stay. Why, Flora? Why? Because now Luik is mine. <laughs> Luik is mine. <laughs> Part two. Hurried Exodus. Come in. Morning, John. Oh. You still in bed? Where else should one be at this unearthly hour? <laughs> oh, look, and I distinctly say it four minutes. Look at it. Damn thing's raw. Well, you know, in some parts of the world, raw egg is considered quite a delicacy. Well, not here it isn't. 
did you discover anything of value in Hugh's notes? Oh, just bits and pieces. It's, it's like a jigsaw puzzle with most of the pieces missing. Well, that's more than we expected. We'll have to put together our own picture and then see how Hugh's pieces fit in. Well, now, let's see. What have we got so far? Hmm? <sighs> I've got a slight feeling of nausea from this revolting egg. <laughs> Perfidious albumen. Oh, no, but he's not at this time of day. Look, pour me some coffee, will you? <laughs> sure. It's my pleasure. <sighs> no, thanks. Now, what have you got so far? The fact that there occurred on this island a mutation of the human species brought about by some genetic transformation of the brain which enables it to receive some form of telepathic communication. Only to receive? Now, what about transmitting telepathic messages? Well, that's huh? not proven, is it? No. We can be certain of only two cases. Molly Kyle, who is now dead, presumably, and Flora Keary, who, at best, is an imperfect example of a different, more highly developed mutation, what Hugh was pleased to call the master race. Controllers would be a more accurate description of those two bizarre ladies. They both seem to have this power of implanting their own thoughts, their own will, in the minds of other mutants. Mm. And so what outwardly look like ordinary human beings become, in fact, extensions of the mind of the controller, without even being aware of it. That's terrifying. Think what Hitler or Stalin might have done with power like that. Think what they did without it. According to Hugh's notes, in the 20 years he was on the island, there were 120 cases of mental disorientation. Mutant metamorphosis. What you will, which gives us 120 mutants under the age of, say, 33. And at least as many over that age. Mm-hmm. 250, all told. And all totally indistinguishable from the rest of the inhabitants. Except for flora. Yes. Except for flora. We've got to get that girl to London. It's the only way. Oh, now, wait a minute. Hang on. That could be a pretty tall order. We must do it somehow. We need to run tests on her, medical checks. And do all the other things that Hugh Dexter tried to do. Precisely. And got himself murdered for. You know, that blaze last night at Hugh's place was no accident, John. It was meant for us. Someone out here just doesn't like us knowing too much. That's why we have to get Flora away from here. Surely you see that. Well, I can see the sense in it, but what I can't see is how to go about it. We'll start with the minister. I'd like our chances a lot better if I disliked him a little less. That man really spooks me. Now, John... About the minister, there's no doubt that he's a mutant. Well, he is a mutant, isn't he? Almost certainly, on the evidence we have. But he's not a controller. I would say it's unlikely. You know, once Flora realized Mrs. Kyle was dead, she said Luig was hers. I don't believe she would have dared say that if the minister was also a controller. No, and when I first met her yesterday, she seemed completely overawed by him. Yeah. Mind you... He is a trifle overbearing. <laughs> Not to mention unpleasant. <laughs> He's much too sinister for my taste. A sinister minister. Oh, Curtis, really. <laughs> Still, this little visit of ours should dent his sanctimonious composure. How so? But I feel sure he hoped. Perhaps he even prayed that we died last night. Well, we'll soon find out. The next few minutes could be quite interesting. Oh, Mr. Cornelius. Whatever's the matter, Mary? Uh, can, uh, come in? Well, thank you. You look as though you'd seen a ghost. Hey, well, we, we thought you must be dead. What made you think that? You're on fire up at the doctor's house last night. We'd gone by then. Yes, fortunate, wasn't it? But uh, Mr. Cornelius said he'd be staying here for the night, and, and when he didn't come the back... The fault is entirely mine, Mary. I, I persuaded him to keep me company at the inn. Eh, hey, well, all's well, I suppose. I'll, uh, I'll get the minister. Minister? Yes, Mary? Could I trouble you? They're coming. Well, what is it, Mary? There's uh, two visitors to see you. Mr. Cornelius and... Uh, Professor Lark. Uh, Professor Lark. Returned from the dead, Minister. What? Well, you did manage to... Escape. We left before the fire broke out. Ah, you were 
unfortunate. We'd feared the worst for that you. That will be all, Mary. Uh, yes, yes, Minister. What about Mrs. Kyle? There's the real tragedy for you. Such a fine woman, a real pillar of strength in the community. She is dead, then? Aye, they brought down the body this morning, or what was left of it. Aye, strange that they should have found her in the doctor's study. Why not? She should have... She was usually out and about in the garden at that time of the day. Well, maybe she was uh, looking for something. Do they know what caused the fire? No, and I doubt they ever will, frankly. When will you be returning to London? Well, we'll get the boat back this afternoon, most probably. Aye. Aye, very wise. And we'd like to take Flora with us. Flora? And what would you want to do a thing like that for? She is ill, Minister. Aye, she has the island sickness. We don't need a brain surgeon to tell us that. Minister, I suspect that she has a tumour. A tumour? On the brain. She has all the classic symptoms. And it's the most likely explanation why she has not returned to normal like everyone else has done. Oh, I see, I see. And I suppose you will be wanting to operate on her yourself, Mr. High and Mighty Cornelius. Only if my first diagnosis proves correct. Well, I'm not committing that poor wee lassie to having her brain meddled with. I have no right, anyway. You don't need one. She has a perfect right of her own. She's of age. But she is not compass mentis, is she? Not all the time, certainly. But some of the time her mentis is so compass it's almost out of sight. And what's that supposed to oh, mean? It's just a manner of speaking. Minister? Well, Mary, what is the matter? Have you, have you seen Flora this morning, Minister? No, why? Her, uh, her bed's not been slept in. She couldn't have come back last night. When was the last time you saw her, Mary? Uh, when, when she went out last evening. We'd better start looking for her. Well, I'm going straight down to the police station. The police station? We can't let that girl roam round loose on the island. We've got to find her b before she does some harm to herself. Uh, my court, Mary, if you would. Yes, yes, Minister. I'll come with you, Minister. And what about you, Professor? No, no, I, I think two's company. I'll just wander up to Hugh's house and poke around in the ashes. You won't find much in there. What? Oh, <laughs> yeah, you're right, officer. Uh, Sergeant, if you don't mind, sir. Sergeant McBenny. Okay, Sergeant. Yeah. Did the minister send you? Yes, sir. What, to uh, keep an eye on me? To help you, sir, if you want. Uh, nice of you. Oh, it's only two minutes on the bike. Um, uh, what are we looking for, by the way? I really don't know. Some of Dr. Dexter's research papers, perhaps. Though I don't think much could have survived this. It's one of the most comprehensive fires I've ever seen. Just as well, if you ask me. Some of the church fellowship took great exception to Dr. Dexter's researches. Now, why would they do that? Well, sir, over the past few years, those researches, as you call them, seem to be aimed exclusively at the fellowship. Oh, come on now. And to no one else. Practically every single member of the fellowship had been investigated by Dr. Dexter at some time or another. Investigated, Sergeant? Oh, that's police language. You mean examined, No, George. sir, I mean investigated, Professor. Brain pictures, blood samples and the like. He even went into our family backgrounds, our ancestry. Oh, aye. It was an investigation, right enough. Did he ever investigate you, Sergeant? Aye, sir. He said it was for the influenza. That was just last year. So you're a member of the Fellowship, too? Yeah. Well, I don't think you're going to find anything here, Professor. No. I guess you're right. I'll, uh, I'll walk you back to the manse, see if there's any news. What of young Flora? So you uh, know about that? Yes. Yes, I was there when they found out. Uh, well, uh, hold on, sir. I'll, uh, I'll just fetch my bike. Okay. I, um, I wonder what makes a girl like that run off. Uh, you mean, uh, uh, Flora? Yeah. Well, I hear you're wanting to operate on her head, and she might not want to see it opened up like a can of beans. It is her head, after all. But no one's told her about that yet. Maybe she doesn't need to be told. 
Oh, dear God. Are you ready now, sir? Yeah, okay, I'm coming. This is the beach road round the head. It's a wee bit further than the path over the top, but it's easier for me with the bike and all. Is that a uh, drop in the head? Aye, sir. Straight up above you. A long way to fall. Poor Hugh. It was an open and shut case, Professor. Not open enough, Sergeant, and shut too damn quick. There's someone up there. Uh, you couldn't see them from here, even if there was. Nobody goes too near the edge. It's in danger of giving way as it is. There's, there's someone up there now. <laughs> no, there are always wee pebbles falling. It's the wind and the rain that does it. <laughs> Look out! Oh, God, sorry, the whole cliff's coming down! Run, Professor! Run for your life! Good Lord! What was that? No, it's nothing. It's just a cliff. There's been a lot of rain recently. Must have weakened the overhang. Ah, it's fortunate that there was no one underneath. But there was. Look. Aye. Aye, there's two of them. That looks like Sergeant McBinney. Come on. We'd best see if they're all right. Curtis, <laughs> <laughs> are you hurt? Oh, yeah. I never felt better. But what happened? That, that damn cliff <laughs> tried to fall down on us. Aye, and it near succeeded, too. Oh. One man or another dropped their head's a pretty dangerous place. <laughs> Especially to foreigners. <sighs> what are you all doing here, anyway? There's been news of Flora. Oh? Uh -huh. Well, apparently she's been seen near an old barn. Uh -huh. Which barn is this? Old Mackenzie's place. One of your men brought the news not five minutes since. We're just on our way over there. I wonder what put it into her head to come out here. Why did Flora stay with you in the first place, Minister? Her parents sent her. Because she was troubled in spirit. And the trouble stayed with her. More's the pity. What about her parents, Minister? Uh, were they members of the Fellowship? Her mother was, but her father was an ungodly man. They were happy for Flora to stay with you? Her father wasn't. Old Keary kicked up a fuss about it. Isn't that right, Minister? Aye, aye, right enough. Why is everyone talking about them in the past tense? As though they were dead. They are dead. They died about two, four years ago. A terrible accident. Not a fire, by any chance. Aye, it was a fire. Oh, Professor, you must be fair. And this island must be very inflammable. Oh, uh, that's the barn up ahead now. Uh, are you sure this is the right place, Minister? It seems odd for a lassie to come here. It was one of your own men who told us, Sergeant. It seems ridiculous coming all the way up here. It's a wild goose chase, if you ask me. You think perhaps we ought to turn back, Sergeant? Th there's no point in going into a place oh, like that. Oh, stop your blathering, man. Uh, stay out. She's not there, I tell you. That's easily proved, Sergeant. Stay out of that barn. Why? Don't argue with him, John. I'm ordering you to stay out. And I am telling you, I'm going in there. Keep out, I tell you. Keep him out. He mustn't come in. Take your hands off my person. Keep like a look out, Minister. Oh, come on, John. Leave them at it. Keep him out. He's past you, man. He must not come in. He's past you. He must uh, what was all that about? The, the police sergeant's a mutant. Didn't you see his eyes? <coughs> <coughs> then why is he fighting the minister of all people? You're right. It doesn't make sense. Unless the minister isn't a mutant, which knocks our theory on the head. I can't work that one out. At least not now. Come on. <sighs> Flora must be in here. Keep them out. Keep them out. Over here. In the corner. Keep him out. Keep him out. It's all right, Flora. It's all over now. There's nothing to be frightened of. Here, blow your nose on there. <laughs> Flora, can you make the policeman go home? What about the minister? Eh? Oh, the minister? Oh, keep him away. The minister's not here, Flora. Honestly. 
At least he's taking no further interest in the proceedings. I, I think the sergeant hit him with his nightstick. Truncheon. All oh, right, Truncheon. The minister's asleep, Flora. He'll never find out about your being here unless Sergeant McBinney tells him. So I want Sergeant McBinney to go away. Don't you? Oh, yes. I want... I want Sergeant McBinney. I want Sergeant McBinney. To go... To go... Away, away from, from here. here. Wish hard, Flora. Wish Sergeant McBinney away from here. I wish Sergeant McBinney away from here. He's going. He just turned and he's walking away. Like a sleepwalker. Bye-bye, Sergeant McBinney. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> I hate breaking things up, John, but I think it's time we were moving out. That boat leaves in an hour. Right. Now, Flora, I thought it might be rather fun to go on a boat. Oh. Have you ever been on one? No. A minister always forbade me. Well, we won't let the minister know. We'll just sneak on board without telling him. Eh? <laughs> Come on, then. Take my hand. Uncle Cornelius is in charge now. Uncle Cornelius? You can forget all about that horrid old minister. Uncle. Uncle Cornelius. Hey, wait for me, Uncle Cornelius. Welcome aboard, sir. May I have your tickets, please? Yes, there are three of us. Thank you very much, sir. Where are the cabins? Well, they're both aft, sir. One on the port side, the other on the starboard. Ours is uh, cabin A. Aft on the port side, sir. Come on, John, Flora. After you, Flora, my dear. Thank you. The cabin is aft on the port side, wherever that is. Straight ahead on this side. Oh. Hmm. Mm, cabin A, here we are. Hey, your cabin awaits you, Uncle Cornelius. Do I have to go in there? Not if you don't want to, my dear. I want to stay outside and look at all the people. All right, you do that. Curtis, we must keep an eye on her. The least little thing could set her off again. You, Mary? You stay with her, John. You're doing just fine. Right. I'll see if I can get some drinks brought up to the cabin, huh? Flora, would you like something to drink? Oh, what can I have? Anything you like. Uh, could I have some wine? Wine? Well, why not? She's over age. Wine it shall be, my lady. Won't take me a minute. Look, look, there's Mary down there. Where? Down there by the gangway. Oh, yes. I wish Mary could come. She'd love a boat ride. Oh, I shouldn't think she'd want to come. She'd want to if I wanted her to. Uh, oh, yes, well, I'm sure she would. Well, then I do want her to come. Flora, no. Come on, little Mary. Come for a boat trip. No, Flora. She doesn't want to come. She hasn't got time. I want her to come. She will come. She has to. Welcome aboard, madam. I must go on board. Uh, may I have your ticket, please? I must go on board. John, your... I've uh, had the drinks put in the cabin. The wine glass is hers. Yes, Curtis, thank goodness you're back. Well, what the hell's going on? She's trying to call Mary on board. Now, Flora, they won't let her on without a ticket being reasonable. Why don't you come and have a glass of wine with us, Flora, to celebrate? No, I want Mary to come. Well, she can't. Then I'm not coming. I don't want a boat trip. We can't get off now, Flora. It's too late. Get her into the cabin. In here, Flora, dear. No. Now come along. No, I come want you. You can't Flora, make get me. Come along. In there. Uh, get in there. No. Oh, uh, uh, Purser, how long before we sail? Any moment now, sir. But what was all that? Oh, it's nothing, Purser. Just a rather spoiled child who doesn't want to go back home to London. <laughs> I don't blame her. He wouldn't get me going into a big city for all the tea in China. <laughs> No good shouting, Flora. You'll just stay there now until we sail. Help, help, take me off. Help, help. Your tickets, take please, sir. Take me off. Your tickets, please. Help take me off. Oh, look here. Take me off. Take me 
Ah, right. Off you go then. Down there, where you just came from. Take me off. Hey, none of that. Come here. I warned you. Take me off. John, let me in. Let me in. Oh, for goodness sake, John, do something. She must be calling every mutant on the island. There'll be a riot if we don't get her under control. The only way to do that is to knock her out. Yeah, exactly. Any suggestions? Mm-hmm. Just to these two. Pop them in her wine glass and make her drink it. That should do the trick. I hope you know what you're doing. Trust me, John. Anyway, I can't stay here chatting with you. I've got an invasion to repel. Now, don't forget to lock the door after me. All right, all right. Hey, none of that. Come here. Take me off. Take me off. It's locked, Purser. Take me off. Oh, my God. Now, you just stop kicking that door down. Off. John, Take for Pete's sake, off. switch her off, will you? Take oh, no, you don't. Oh, no. Come on. Oh, no. oh, you off. don't. Come on. Off. Get no. off. What, what are you doing? Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon. Awfully oh, sorry, that's, sir. That's quite all right, Percy. What? What happened? Well, I thought you were going to fall, so I, I just grabbed you. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Are you feeling all right now? Yes. Yes, thank you, sir. I wonder what came over me. Anyway, if you'll excuse me, sir, we'll be sailing almost immediately. I must attend to my duty. John! Open up, John. It's me, Curtis. Come in. What have you been doing? Oh, I've been swapping bedtime stories with the purser. Hey, where's that drink, John? I, I think I've earned it. There you are, dear boy. Oh, Scotch, as usual. Oh, boy. <laughs> I hope you don't mind. We started without you. Didn't we, Flora? <laughs> yes, we did, Uncle Cornelius. Oh, it's lovely. Oh, they say you like the wine, Flora. Hmm? Oh, <laughs> yes. He never let me drink wine. Who didn't? The minister? Aye. Well, he'll have to let you now, won't he? <laughs> Aye. Oh, as long as you don't tell him. Oh. Catch up, oh. Curtis. Ready oh. and waiting, sir. <laughs> oh, what was it? Your famous Mickey Finn again? Yes, sir. Double measure. It's very good, isn't it? It is the best. What was all that commotion outside the cabin? Oh, my dear John, I was repelling borders, or trying to... Quite apart from the little army of mutants down on the dock, our friendly neighborhood purser decided to join in the fun and kick the door down. Great Scott, the purser? How did you stop him? Well, I interposed my body between him and the cabin door. Clever, eh? And he kicked me on the ankle, damn <laughs> him. <laughs> Mind you, he wasn't really himself at the time, but when he came to his senses, he apologized and went about his duties like a good little purser. Extraordinary. The purser's an unexpected complication, oh, isn't he? yes, he was a real shaker. I just wasn't prepared for a mutant here on the boat. But it's a normal enough job for an islander, plying back and forth to the mainland. Yeah, but I wonder how many mutants have used the boat to get off the island altogether, and whether they went of their own free will or under orders. <laughs> That was part two of Aliens in the Mind, co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius, with Henry Stamper as Donald Skula, Sandra Clark, Flora Keary, Fraser Carr, Police Sergeant, Irene Sutcliffe, Mary, and Andrew Sear, the purser. Aliens in the Mind was written by René Basilico from an idea by Robert Holmes. Production by John Dias. Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, 
inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. N. Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Aliens in the Mind Co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius Convinced that the apparently simple-minded Flora Keary must be the key to the mysterious genetic mutation affecting the inhabitants of Lewig, Lark and Cornelius persuade her to leave the island and come with them to London. But no sooner have they got her on board the boat to the mainland than Flora changes her mind. I don't want a boat trip. We can't get off now, Flora. It's too late. Get into the cabin. In here, Flora. Dear. No. Now come along. No, I come. won't. You can't Flora, make get me. Come along. In there. <laughs> get in there. No. Oh, uh, uh, Purser, uh, how long before we sail? Any moment now, sir. But what was all that? Oh, it's nothing, Purser. Just a rather spoiled child who doesn't want to go back home to London. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame her. He wouldn't get me going into a big city for all the tea in China. <laughs> No good shouting, Flora. You'll just stay there now until we sail. Help, help, take me off. Help, help. Your tickets, take please, sir. Me take me off. Your tickets, please. Help take me off. Oh, look here. Take me off. Take me off. Take me off. Right, off you go then. Down there, where you just came from. Take me off. Take me off. Hey, none of that. Come here. I warned you. Let me find your horse. John, let me in. Let me in. Oh, for goodness sakes, John, do something. She must be calling every mutant on the island. There'll be a riot if we don't get her under control. The only way to do that is to knock her out. Yeah, exactly. Any suggestions? Mm hmm. Just to these two. Pop them in her wine glass and make her drink it. That should do the trick. I hope you know what you're doing. Trust me, John. Anyway, I can't stay here chatting with you. I've got an invasion to repel. Now, don't forget to lock the door after me. All right, all right. Take me off. Take me off. It's locked, Purser. Take me off. Oh, my God. Now, you just stop kicking that door down. John, for Pete's sake, switch her off, will you? Oh, no, you don't. Oh, no. Come. Oh, you don't. Come in. Oh. No. What, what are you doing? Oh. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm awfully oh, sorry, that's, sir. That's quite all right, Percy. What? What happened? Well, I thought you were going to fall, so I, I just grabbed you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. You feeling all right now? Yes. Yes, thank you, sir. I wonder what came over me. Anyway, if you'll excuse me, sir, we'll be sailing almost immediately. I must attend to my duties. John! Open up, John! It's me, Curtis! Come in. What have you been doing? Oh, I've been swapping bedtime stories with the purser. Quite apart from the little army of mutants down on the dock, 
our friendly neighborhood purser decided to join in the fun and kick the door down. Great Scott, the purser? How did you stop him? Well, I interposed my body between him and the cabin door. Clever, eh? And he kicked me on the ankle, damn <laughs> him. <laughs> Mind you, he wasn't really himself at the time, but when he came to his senses, he apologized and went about his duties like a good little purser. Extraordinary. The purser's an unexpected complication, oh, isn't he? Yes, he was a real shaker. I just wasn't prepared for a mutant here on the boat. But it's a normal enough job for an islander, plying back and forth to the mainland. Yeah, but I wonder how many mutants have used the boat to get off the island altogether, and whether they went of their own free will or under orders. <laughs> Part 3. Unexpected Visitations. Sherry? No, prefer scotch. Say when. Boop. <laughs> Help yourself to water, dear fellow. Oh, there you are. You. Thanks. What about you? No, thanks. I'll have a small manzanilla. You know, John, I, I really envy you this apartment. Wish I could afford a place like it. I wish I could afford three wives. Oh, ho, ho, ho. but you don't envy me my three wives. Oh, no. <laughs> Not all three of them. Whereas I do envy you your apartment. Well, these were my consulting rooms originally. Uh, yeah, I noticed all the equipment. Most of it's pretty out of date these days. Now, that's why I insisted on taking Flora to the hospital. We can do every test you can think of there. Is that where she is now? Yes, in the radioisotope laboratory. I want to put her under the gamma camera. What do you expect to find, John? Some sort of brain lesion? Well, if the brain has undergone any physical change, it's probably the best chance we have of finding it. Have you considered that there might be no physical abnormality involved? Uh, just an intensified refinement of some particular sense or sensitivity? After all, telepathy is nothing new. This is not telepathy as much as thought transference. The so-called controllers transferring their thoughts to other mutants. Look, John, whatever form this mutation takes, in Flora's case, it's somehow gone askew. Most of the time, she behaves like a mentally retarded child, when in fact she's really as much a mutant controller as, as Mrs. Kyle was. Ah, oh, yes, but with Flora, that power only manifests itself when she's frightened or disturbed in some way emotionally disturbed. That's what I'm getting at, John. The point is, why? Oh, I have no idea. No, but she has. Or at least she may have. Some traumatic emotional experience. Her parents, dying in that fire, for instance, could have the same effect at puberty as it does at the menopause. Mm, it's certainly possible. There must be ways of finding out it, it could be the key to the whole case. Yes, it could. Hey, you know, I know just the man. Kalman Baramek, a Persian. Why do all your friends have to live on the other side of the world, Curtis? <laughs> You'd be glad to know that this one doesn't. He lives on the other side of Regent's Park. Careful, Flora. It's oh. quite a big step down. I'll take care of this. What do I owe you? Uh, it'll be uh, 85p, please, sir. All right, here you are. Keep the change. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, what do you think, John? Nice location, isn't it? Right opposite the zoo. Very therapeutic. Can we go and see the animals? Uh, later, Flora, when we've seen Mr... Uh, Dr. Baramek. Oh. Carmen nice. Baramek. He's on the second floor, I think. Witchley, Hazel. Ah, oh, here we are. Baramek. Oh, please, let's go and see the animals. Later, Flora. That's a promise, Flora. Who is it? Uh, Curtis Lark. Come up to the second floor, please. In we go, Flora. Come in, Curtis. It's good to see you again. Oh, it's been a long time, Kalman. Uh, may I introduce my good friend, John Cornelius? Dr. Baramek. How do you do? And this is Miss Flora Keary. Ah, so you are Flora. I'm very pleased to meet you. Hello. Make yourself comfortable, please. Well, thank you. Now, 
Can I get you something to drink? A cup of tea, perhaps? Well, that would be most welcome. Joanne? Yes, Doctor? Uh, Joanne, I think we'd all like some tea. And perhaps you could tempt the palate of this young lady. This is Flora Keery. Hello, I'm Joanne Harrington. Perhaps you could come and choose something you like. Not really. I... Come on. We've got all sorts of goodies hidden away in here. Mr. Cornelius, may I ask you if you retain a professional interest in this case? I mean, as a brain surgeon. No, only a personal one, at least for the moment. Well, my own view is that there is some block, some psychological block, that inhibits her development. Uh, not a physical one. Not as far as we can ascertain. Mm, it is all quite possible. What would you try, Kalman? Uh, hypnosis? Hmm? I think so. From what you told me on the telephone, her subconscious will make much more sense than her conscious. When will you attempt it? Now. Joanne has already started. Oh. We asked the patient to look at some kaleidoscopic pattern placed in front of a small light. When we revolve this pattern, it creates a rhythmic pulsation on the retina. Isn't this something to do with some research they did with helicopter pilots? Just a few years back, hmm? uh, That's right. The helicopter blades were stropping across the pilot's vision and inducing almost instant drowsiness. I think I'd better go in now. I'll call you when I've got the girl in hand. How long will that be? Oh, a few minutes only, no more. How is it going, Joanne? Quite well, Doctor. Well, now this one. Couldn't we look at this pattern a little longer? I've seen that one. Okay, then. Let's look at that one. Joanne? Just a moment, Flora. You keep looking at this picture. Coming, Doctor. We've got problems, I think. What problems? She won't give it long enough. As soon as she seems to be relaxing, she snaps out of it and asks for a new one. I see. Flora? Yes? What do you want? I want to play a little game with this pattern. Can you see a red spot? A tiny, tiny red spot, just above the middle of the pattern. Oh, yes. The one that keeps going on and off. That's the one. Now, watch it carefully and tell me every time you see it come on. Just say now. Every time you see it. Now. No. That's good. Very good. No. No. Excellent, Flora. No. 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 More tea? Oh, no, thanks. I'm fine like this. He said a few minutes. It's over an hour now. What's happening? I'm afraid she's proving rather a difficult subject. Well, I suppose we should have expected it. Joanne, do you think you could keep an eye on her? Of course, Doctor. Let her lie down on the couch in there. The girl's exhausted. I'll get a blanket. Well, tell us what happened, Carman. Nothing. You were unable to hypnotize her? Let us say, rather, that she successfully resisted all my efforts. Curtis, when you briefed me about this case, you told me that uh, she had shown signs of extraordinary mental power. Yes, that's right. By extraordinary. Did you mean extrasensory? Well, well, that's what we suspect. We have indications, but no proof. No positive proof. Nothing we could submit as scientific evidence. Unless you've discovered something, Kalman. Yes, I felt something. It was as though she had some sort of antennae. The energy, the mental energy she was generating was quite extraordinary. What do you do now? We have to find ways of reducing her resistance. You mean drugs, of course, hmm? Mm, a diazepam should suffice. It will bring her to that drowsy, twilight zone between waking and sleeping. It's very much like a hypnotic trance, anyway. When do you propose to use the diazepam? That depends on whether you want me to, Mr. Cornelius. Why? It's not dangerous, is it? No, no, of course not. But the girl doesn't want me to continue. Subconsciously, her resistance is almost fanatical. Well, it's in her own interest to continue, Carmine. No, Curtis. It's in our interests. It may be in hers, if we're lucky. Well, either way, we have to go on. Right, John? I suppose so. Then I suggest that you should both return in about oh, an hour or so. I think we should let Flora rest that long. Well, looks like we've got an hour to kill. <laughs> so what will you do? I think we should go and see... Who? 
The monkeys at the zoo. Now, whatever for? Well, why not? I always find them very therapeutic. therapeutic. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> okay, let's go to the zoo. Fascinating creatures. I suppose so. What do you mean, you suppose so? All human nature is there in that cage. Oh, and yet when Darwin first propounded his theory of evolution, he was laughed right out of court. Only because no one wanted to believe him. And no one will want to believe us, John. Telepathy's a, a musical act. Not on this scale, it isn't. What scale, John? This is London, not the Isle of Louis. All we have is flora. Curtis, you said she might be the key to this whole case. I happen to agree with you. Yes, but supposing Kalman does succeed in straightening her out, what then? I mean, does she become just another Molly Kyle? If you ally a controller's powers with any sort of real ambition, the consequences are unimaginable. Oh, come on, Curtis. That's a bit far-fetched, isn't it? One of the reasons for bringing her to London was that there's no one here she can use those powers. Oh, of. isn't there? Now, I know I'm only a poor, ignorant foreigner, but I understood that there had been an almost continuous migration from the Western House for the last 150 years. That may be true. And isn't it also true that not so long ago this country had a prime minister who was the grandson of a Scottish crofter? Oh, well, yes, but he, he went to Eton first. Oh. Oh, don't be silly. That's not the point. No, but it does make a difference. Well, it might have made one hell of a difference if that crofter had come from Lewig. Oh, that's a bit of star-spangled imagination if ever I heard one. There, you see. <laughs> Even you don't want to believe it. Well, damn it all, we can't go marching up to the police and announce that the Prime Minister may be a mutant and a menace to society. But well, who can we go marching up oh, to? Oh, do be serious, Curtis, please. I am serious. There have been at least three generations of mutants on Lewig. Some of them must have migrated south. And their descendants could by now have risen to positions of immense power and influence. Then, if you're right, Curtis, presumably the mutant powers or susceptibilities would have lain dormant and will continue to do so. Unless there are any controllers around. John, can you really believe it's safe to assume that there are no controllers around? Well, they still wouldn't believe us, Curtis. We have to build up an unshakable case, supported by irrefutable scientific evidence. Well, we could only do that by going back to Lewig, and even that could take years. Yes, I know. That's why Flora must be the key to this case. I should... Oh, look, I, I think it's time we were getting back to her. Oh, Professor Locke, Mr. Cornelius, thank God you've come. My, what's happened? It's Dr. Baranek. Where is he? In here. Come on. Are you all right? Mm, no, more or less. A little sore between the ears, perhaps. I thought he'd killed him. You thought what? That man, that, that, that oh, maniac. Right, nurse, now come over here and sit down and relax a minute. And then tell us what happened from the start. Now take it slowly. And try not to leave anything out. Well, it was um, not more than ten minutes ago. I, I just looked at Flora. She was restless, very restless. I was telling Dr. Baramek when there was a ring at the door, uh, not the street door, the door of this apartment. Am I expecting someone, Joanne? Well, you've no appointment. I wonder who let them in from the street. Perhaps it's the caretaker. I'll go and see. All right, all right, I'm coming. Can I help? Yeah. Hey, yeah. where do you think oh, you're going? Yeah. Come oh, back. Yeah. Doctor, look, you just can't go barging in. Oh, yeah. Look out, Doctor, he's a red yeah. lunatic. Sit down, won't yeah. you? I'd rather you sat down and told me about it. Doctor. I think it's all right. Thank you, Duran. You can't go in there. No. Stop. You can't you stop. Can't stop. I tell you. You killed him. You killed him. Away from me. Oh. We can go now. Doctor. I'm ready. Dr. Baramek, are you all right? Doctor. Oh, my God. Bye-bye, Doctor. Flora. I'm going now. 
This nice man's taking me away from here. But Flora, what about Professor Locke, Mr... Flora, you just can't walk out on them like that. But she did walk out, just like that? Yes. Without coercion? But they went out hand in hand, like a couple of young lovers. How old was this man? Oh, Mid-forties, I suppose, you know, greying at the temple. Quite distinguished looking, really. And a very distinguished walking cane. Ebony, by the feel of it. Oh, poor Carman. I, I am sorry about that. I'm sorry about the girl. Do you want me to get the police in? Oh, if you could bear not to, Carmen, I'd, I'd be very grateful. I thought that might be the case. John wanted to phone them earlier. We should report that she's missing. Just missing? Or strayed. But not stolen. <laughs> Definitely not stolen. Not yet. Where's the phone? You can use the one in the office. Here, I'll show you. Thank you. There are a hundred questions, Curtis. Yes, I know, old friend, and so few answers, so very few. When Joanne was recounted what happened just now, it dawned upon me that that man was behaving in much the same way as a person under direction. Yes, I know. The question is, my dear Carman, under whose direction? Oh, John, what did the police have to say? They've already found her. Oh, good. She was seen wandering about the streets in a daze. What about the men? They didn't mention him. They've taken Flora straight round to my flat. I didn't want to involve you, Dr. Baramek. Thank you. It was a kind thought, but perhaps you would allow me to involve myself. Well, as long as you're coming, you might as well bring that sedative with you. What was it? Dizepan. Oh, yeah. Well, you better bring some. <laughs> we might need it. I'll go, Curtis. Mr. Cornelius? Yes? I've brought back Miss... Flora, thank heavens you're safe. We were so worried about you. Hello. Curtis, it is Flora. You must be exhausted, child. Come along. Take her into the sitting room, Curtis. All right, come on, Flora. <laughs> what happened to you? Thank you so much, officer. Come in, won't you? Oh, thank you, sir. I can't tell you how relieved we are to have Flora back. Glad to have been of service, sir. She is, sir, uh, all right, isn't she, sir? How do you mean? Well, she was just wandering around in the middle of the road. All over the place she was. And the way she talked, well, at first we thought she was on a trip. A trip? You know, drugged, acid, oh. LSD. Oh, no, nothing nothing like that, no, no. She was probably just disorientated. She's lived all her life in a remote Scottish island. I think she was just overwhelmed by the noise and bustle of London. It happens sometimes. Mm. Usually with old people, though. <laughs> That's right, officer. Anyway, thank you once more. All part of the service, sir. Goodbye. But I still don't understand, John, why Carmen didn't want to give the injection himself. He thought it was better for me to do it. She doesn't trust him, you see. Oh, I see, yes. Well, she seems to be fully under now. Do you think it's safe to call him in? Yes, if you'll be so kind, Curtis, then we can make a start. All right. Uh, Carmen, you can come in now. I think she's nearly ready. John gave her the injection. I'm sure I was right to keep out of the way. Even now, the sound of my voice might upset her. So could I suggest that you also carry out the questioning yourself? Either of you or both, if you like. I'll just watch and keep an eye on things. Okay, then. You ready, John? Ready and willing. Well, let's not keep the lady waiting. Flora. Flora, can you hear me? Yes. Where were you born, Flora? I was born at Lewick... On the Isle of Lewig. And now Lewig is yours, isn't it? Yes, Lewig is mine. <laughs> Why, Flora? Why is Lewig yours? Because they have to do what I tell them. How do you tell them, Flora? I, don't, I tell don't them... Don't confuse her. She doesn't know. And the fellowship does what you tell them? I. Not what the minister tells them. No, never. He just tells Molly Kyle what to tell them. So that was the setup. I never did like that sanctimonious. <laughs> but Molly Kyle is dead, Flora. Aye, Molly Kyle's dead. And there's no one else that can tell them what to do? Not now. There's only me. <laughs> well, that's a relief. <laughs> Flora, why did you let Molly Kyle die? Careful. Because... Because she killed my mother. I wanted to pay her back the way she paid back my mother. 
Paid her back? For May what, Flora? Uh, Make her uh, tell us about it. Tell us about it, Flora. Good. Take your time and tell us about it. Very good. She found out Kiri was not my father. So she... she punished my mother. Punished her for begetting me in sin. She burned her. Burned her in hell fire. She told her her legs were paralyzed. And my mother thought she couldn't walk. And she just lay there, screaming and screaming for help. And the flames came nearer and nearer. And I kept willing her to walk. But Molly Kyle was too strong. She was willing my mother to keep struggling and screaming so that when Kiri came in to rescue her, she wouldn't let him move her. And then it was too late. That They were burned in hellfire and Mother was still screaming for help. Help! Help! Oh, help me, somebody! Oh, for God's sake, I'm burning! Is she all right? It's a oh, nobody, it's help all right. Me. I'm burning! Oh. I'm burning! Hold her down! Please. Hold her down! For God's sake, Please. hold her down! Oh, God. Can't we stop her? A Mickey Finn, Curtis, your headhunters grew. I wouldn't dare, not on top of the other. It's all right, Flora. It's all right. Get some water, John. Right. There you are. What's that? What's going on? Sounds like somebody's breaking down your door. I'd better go and find out. Here, what do you think you're doing? I say, look out, I... Look here, oh! It's him, the same man as this afternoon. It's no, not him. No, no, no. Keep still, come on. But it's him. I know, I know, but just look at him. It's as though he were hypnotized. He doesn't even know we're here. Oh. 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 For God's sake, oh. Curtis, are you just going to let him pick up the girl and walk out with her? But there's no way of stopping him. Where's he taking her? Didn't either of you recognize him? Recognize him? Why should we? It's Ian Sanderson. Well, who's he? He's an MP, the opposition spokesman on defense matters. Oh, my God. Isn't anybody going to follow him? Well, you can do, but I think you'll find he's only taking you across the road. What makes you say that? Because he lives there. But I just don't understand it. I think I do. What was a subject for scientific research has suddenly become a question of national security. That was part three of Aliens in the Mind, co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius, with Sandra Clark as Flora Keary, Steve Pleitus, Calman Baramek, Joan Matheson, Joanne, and Andrew Sear as the police constable. Aliens in the Mind was written by René Basilico from an idea by Robert Holmes. Production by John Dias. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist 
labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Aliens in the Mind Co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius Lark and Cornelius take Flora Keary away from the remote Isle of Lewig with its frightening colony of mutants and bring her to London where they hope to investigate her mysterious powers as a controller. Under hypnosis, Flora unwittingly exposes more of the mutants, nearer to home. Flora, why did you let Molly Kyle die? Careful. Because she found out Kiri was not my father. So she she punished my mother. Punished her for begetting me in sin. She burned her. Burned her in hell fire. She told her her legs were paralyzed. And my mother thought she couldn't walk. And she just lay there screaming and screaming for help. And the flames came nearer and nearer. And, and then it was too late. That they were burned in hellfire. And Mother was still screaming for help. 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 Oh, help me, somebody. Oh, for God's sake, I'm burning. Is she all right? It's a paroxysm. Oh, it's all right. Me. I'm burning. I'm burning. Hold her down. Hold her down. For God's sake, hold her down. Oh, God, can't we stop her? It's all right. Right. There you are. What's that? What's going on? Hey! Here, what do you think you're doing? I say, look out! I, I look here! Oh! Stop him! No, no, no! Keep still, come on! For God's sake, oh. Curtis, are you just going to let him pick up the girl and walk out with her? But there's no way of stabbing him. Where's he taking her? Didn't either of you recognize him? Recognize him? Why should we? It's Ian Sanderson. Well, who's he? He's an MP, the opposition spokesman on defense matters. Oh, my God. But I just don't understand it. I think I do. What was a subject for scientific research has suddenly become a question of national security. Part 4. Official Intercessions. Would you mind just filling that in, please, sir? Certainly. You too, please, sir. What is it? A security pass, sir. What do they keep in here, John? The crown jewels? This is the home office, not the Tower of London. Well, what do they keep here? I sometimes wonder. There. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, your appointment's with Colonel Gulliver, is it, sir? That's right. Yes, he'd be in room... Uh... Yes, here we are, room 517. 517? Yes, sir. Follow that corridor down to the end and then take the lift to the fifth floor, sir. If you turn right when you get out, you'll find 517 almost facing you. Thank you very much. Come along, Curtis, my boy. I'm coming. You can't miss it, sir. The rooms are clearly numbered. John, you know, what I don't understand is if this Gulliver is a colonel, what's he doing in the home office, huh? Well, Harry Gulliver's ex-army, actually. Something to do with security now. Uh. Bit tight-lipped on the surface, but... Not a bad sort when you get to know him. Anyway, you sometimes have generals in the White House, don't you? Oh, yes, and we usually end up regretting. <laughs>
What do they want, Gulliver? I've no idea, sir. Not yet. Oh, damn it, man. I would have thought you'd have enough in your play without inviting coach loads of civilians to come poking their noses in the security cabinet. Oh, I suppose you know what you're oh, doing. excuse me. What? Oh, good day to you, sir. Uh, good day to you, sir. Ah, oh, there you are, Cornelius. Sorry Good morning, about that. Colonel. May I introduce Professor Curtis Lark, Colonel Gulliver? Ah, oh, pleased to meet you, Professor. Uh, hello, Colonel. Uh, who, who was that that just went out? Uh, Brigadier Sherman, my head of department. Like oh. the tank, you know? Bit yeah. of a blimp, really. <laughs> uh, take a pew, won't you? Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Well, now, what's all this about? You tell it, John. Me? Yeah, you won't embroider it as much as I would. Oh, very well. <coughs> it all started on the Isle of Luig. Where we... the hell's that? Luig? Oh, it's one of the Outer Hebrides. Professor Lark and I had gone up there to attend the funeral of a mutual friend. Now, let me get this straight, Cornelius. You're telling me that up on this Scottish island, um... Uh, whatever it's called. The Isle of Luig. Yes, yes, yes. There were these people, these, um, uh, mutants, didn't you call them? That's right. Uh, who can be manipulated simply by having thoughts put into their heads by these, um, um, controllers. Without the mutants being aware of it. That's the point, Colonel. They have no recollection of having been manipulated in this way. And it's all done by telepathy. Almost certainly. Well, it all sounds a bit like science fiction, I must say. Telepathy and mutants and all that. I mean, it sounds more like, um, more like, um... H.G. Wells? Hmm? Uh, who? <laughs> Wasn't it Wells who wrote, In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Oh, very clever. Thanks. Uh, well, you must admit, it, it sounds rather unbelievable. Anyway, I, I really can't see why you should come to me with this fairy tale. We found one of these controllers, as we call them, a girl about 19 years old called Flora Keary. And we managed to get her to London for various tests. Now, they might prove something or other. Uh-huh. Well, that sounds more promising. Indeed. But somebody walked off with her last night. Walked off? Yes, stole, kidnapped. Abducted is the word, Curtis. Ah, oh, thank you. Uh, yes, someone abducted her, Colonel. And have you informed the police of this um, abduction? That won't be necessary. We know who the man is and why he did it. And why did he do it? Because she told him to. She just put the thought in his head. Ah. You, you mean this fellow was a, was a... one of these mutants? Is one of them, Colonel. He is also a member of Parliament. Is that meant to be some sort of joke, Cornelius? Oh, you haven't heard the payoff line yet. What does he mean, Cornelius? Why can't the damn fellow speak English? Uh, in my friend's vernacular, uh, you ain't heard nothing yet. Come to the point, damn it. A mutant MP is one of the opposition spokesmen on defence matters. Oh, no! Now do you see why we came to you with this, sir? Uh... Fairy tale, Colonel. One way or another, I think we put that over rather well, John. You know, we'd make quite a good double act on the hall. Oh, saints <laughs> preserve us. Personally, I felt we were hamming like mad. <laughs> Don't we always? <laughs> Speak for yeah, yourself. May I trouble you with your passes, gentlemen? Yes, of course, there are. Okay, here you go. Thank you, John. Good day to you. Good day. Fresh air at last. Yes, it was a bit stuffy in there. Mm. But I think old Gulliver got the message in the end. Yes, but will he do anything about it? I doubt it. He can't move openly against someone like Sanderson without definite proof. And we've no proof without Flora. No, that's the next step, isn't it? Yes, but what can we do? We can't just walk up and ask for her back. What? What did you just say? I said we can't just walk up to Sanderson and ask him to give Flora back to us. But that's exactly what we can do. In fact, it's the only way. It is. My dear Curtis, you really do have the most unerring nose for these things. Oh, I don't know. It's quite an ordinary nose, really. Chic, perhaps. Uh, patrician, even. Mm, you soon alter that. <laughs> yes? John Cornelius, I telephoned earlier. Oh, yes, Mr. Cornelius, and this must be... Professor Curtis Lark. Indeed. Uh, do come in. Mr. Sanderson is expecting you. Thank you. If you would care to wait here for a moment, I'll inform Mr. Sanderson of your arrival. Thank you. If you'd excuse me. A real old world English butler. Isn't he just adorable? Down, Curtis, down. Uh, this way, if you please. Uh, Mr. Cornelius, uh, Professor Lark, sir. 
Ah, uh, thank you, Gwent. Uh, do come in, won't you? This is Professor Lark, sir, and I am do. Dr. Medius. How do you do? Hello. Uh, sit yourselves down, won't you? Thank, thank you. you so much. Oh, I know you both by name, of course, and in your case, Mr. Cornelius is by reputation. But uh, I can't pretend to understand the, uh, the reason for this visit. I'll come straight to the point, Mrs. Henderson. We've just returned from the Isle of Luig. Luig? Oh, good heavens, I was born there. So we understand. Oh, it's such a beautiful place. Marvellous place to grow up in. It has many, many happy associations for me. Oh, uh, you were saying uh, about Luig? When we came back, we brought with us a young lady who showed all the classic symptoms of what could prove to be a brain tumour. We wanted to run a series of medical checks on her. She's been living in John's apartment just across the road until uh, yesterday evening. When she disappeared? Yes. Her name is Flora Keary. Yes, uh, I know. Oh, strange, isn't it? So many years later, not knowing what she was or where she was or what she looked like. And then suddenly waking, as from a dream... And finding she had come from nowhere to hold your hand and ask to be taken home for tea. And you suddenly realise that all her life she will just stay a child and never do anything but hold your hand and ask to be taken home for tea. Ah, uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't quite follow. Oh, you've brought me hope, Mr Cornelius. A small hope, but something that I can hang on to, that I, I can at least begin to understand. And for that, I thank you, both for myself and my daughter. Your what? Flora Keary is my daughter, Professor. My natural daughter. Holy mackerel. Never profane the mackerel, my dear Curtis. It is the most underrated fish. Well smoked and washed down with a little muscadet, it is, to the more discerning palate, eminently preferable to the more esteemed and popular trout. John. Mm hmm It was I who suggested the mackerel. Did you? And the muscadet. Oh, really? Mm. Then I commend you, my dear Curtis. Your palate is obviously improving. <laughs> Could we get back to cases, do you think? Oh, by all means. You obviously doubt Sanderson's claim to be Flora's father. Yes, frankly, I do, John. I, I honestly do. It's all too pat, too glib. Well, he seems to believe it. And I think that was genuine. Yes, but who's to say that she didn't put the idea into his head? Mm -hmm. She desperately needs affection, security, someone to lean on. She only had to think of him as her father, and he would have accepted it as fact. Agreed, but at least the dates matched. And I really don't think she could have put all that background detail into his head. Well, you could be right. I can't see how she could have known all that stuff either. No. I'm sure all she knew was that her mother was murdered for, what did she call it, begetting her in sin. Yes, yes. It all comes back to the Reverend Donald Schooler, doesn't it? That man's got an awful lot to answer for. And since the Reverend Schooler is the only person able to verify Sanderson's story, we have no option but to accept it at face value, at least for the moment. Well, does that mean we have to leave Flora in Sanderson's care? I really don't see what else we can do. She'll be well looked after, and we have complete access to her. Besides... Besides what? Well, what will we do with Laura when we've finished all our tests and checks? Send her back to Louis? Into the Reverend Schooler's tender clutches over my dead body. Quite right. Sanderson's claim to be her father could suit us very well. Very well indeed. Could it, John? Or could it be risking Flora's life? Curtis, melodrama does not become you. It sits badly on your accent. <laughs> but look now, honestly, seriously, there, there must be a controller behind Sanderson. It doesn't necessarily follow just because Sanderson is a mutant. No, but it's possible and you know it. I mean, otherwise, you would never have suggested going to someone like Gulliver. All right, Curtis. Point taken. Good then no fully-fledged controller is going to take kindly to a, a butterfly mind like Flora's fouling up the works. No. No, I would think that might well be true. On the other hand, one could argue that if there is another controller, Flora's butterfly mind 
might be just the thing to flush him out into the open. You make it sound more like a sprat to catch a mackerel. How appropriate, Curtis. <laughs> more wine, dear fellow. Yeah, thanks. Well, John, once we get back to the flat, what's our next step going to be, hmm? To amuse Flora. Poor Sanderson seems most anxious for us to maintain our professional interest in the girl. Yeah. And we certainly want to keep her under observation. Absolutely. Well, so it might be a nice gesture if you were to invite Flora to do a little sightseeing. Me? Why me? Or oh, why not? It's much more likely that you would want to see the sights than I would, after all. <laughs> you are a foreigner. Xenophobia ill becomes you, John. Though it does sit well enough on that accent. <laughs> I thought the changing of the guard might be appropriate. Buckingham Palace? No, Horse Guards Parade. Uh. Then I thought we might perhaps pop in for morning coffee with Colonel Gulliver. His office is quite close by. And here I was thinking Machiavelli was dead. Oh, aren't the horses lovely? Oh, they're beautiful. Yes. Oh, why aren't all the soldiers wearing red? Because they're from two different regiments. The ones in red are the lifeguards, uh -huh. and the ones in blue are the royal horse guards. Or is it the other way round, Curtis? Well, why ask me? They're your... <laughs> your soldiers, John. Oh, no. What's the matter, Flora? Someone's looking for me. Oh, come on, Flora, relax. Look at the soldiers. They're so pretty. I think striking would be more apt. I want to go home. But we've only just arrived. Someone's looking for me. Oh, nonsense, Flora. I'm frightened. I want to go home. Oh, no, come along, Flora. Don't be so silly. You're imagining things. That doesn't reassure me one whit. Please. John, why don't you take Flora and go see our friend Gulliver, huh? And what do you propose doing? Well, I'll hang around here and make sure that no one is following her. Following? Oh, come on, Curtis. Oh, please, I must go home. You know, John, as well as I do, that Flora has an unfortunate habit of being right about these things. Anyway, it might even be the first of your mackerel. Please. Do as I suggest, please, John. Take Flora to see Gulliver. If anyone is following her, there's no way he can cross a street as wide as Whitehall without showing himself. And if he does? Well, then I'll follow him, of course. Oh, oh very well. Come along then, Flora. Oh, thank you. There's no one following us yet. He's still looking for me. Well, I wish he'd show himself if he's going to. Oh, so do I. I wish he'd show himself. I wish he'd show himself. Oh, I'm frightened. There, there, Flora. There's nothing to be frightened of. You're quite safe enough with me, I promise. You. Oh, there he is! Oh! Oh. Oh. Poor devil. Slight concussion. Contusions on the face and arms. Nothing serious, Colonel. Where is he now? In the hospital, presumably. They took him off in an ambulance. And you think he was following you? Following Flora, Colonel. I'm sure of it. He was looking for me. He was the one. Well, he wasn't one of my men. His name was McBinney. How do you know that? Well, we checked his identity before they put him in the ambulance. Well, I don't have anyone of that name on my staff. The police on the Isle of Lewig have a sergeant by that name. This wasn't the same man, though. No, but... There's uh... lots of McBinney's on Lewig. Miss Keary, is there any reason, any reason at all, why anyone from Lewig should be looking for you? To take me back. Flora, listen to me. Did you want that man, McBinney, did you want him to cross the road? Oh, I wanted him to show himself. I didn't mean to hurt him. I wanted him to show himself. It's all right, Flora. <laughs> really, it is. There, dear. You said you wanted him to show himself. Well, so I concentrated and willed him to. I didn't know he'd get hurt. Stop this silly charade. I don't believe a word of it. It's all some damn fool prank. I'm surprised at you, Cornelius, a man in your position. And you, young lady. I don't know what you hope to gain from all this nonsense. I want to go home. No, I'm sure you do, but you're not going. Take me home. 
You're not going anywhere till we've got to the bottom of this tissue of ludicrous lies. Take me home. Sit down. Steady on, Colonel. There's no need to adopt that tone. I shall adopt whatever damn tone I please. Take me home. And you can stop that sniveling. Oh, come on now, Flora. Be a good girl and keep quiet. Take me home. I want to go away from here. Yes, I know, Flora. Just leave it to old Uncle Corny. Eh? He's going to talk our way out of this, sorry. Am I? Well, you've certainly got some explaining to do. Take huh? me home. Make it be a Sherman. Take What can I do for you, sir? Home. But, sir, I'm Forget take it, Colonel. Me There's nothing you can do home. but what? We can go home. We can go home. Please. We can go home. We can go home. We can go home. Where's he taking her? Home, by the sound of it. We'd better go after them. You go, John. You might be able to sweet-talk her into switching off. And you? I'd better stay here. I've got some explaining to do. Do your best. Okay. Would you mind filling me in? What, what exactly is going on around here? Well, to put it simply... Flora's been sending out telepathic distress signals, and your gallant brigadier answered them. You mean... I do. And it couldn't happen to a nicer man. But the, the brigadier's the head of the department. Well, in that case, Colonel, the department's got quite a headache. You should have seen poor Gulliver's face, John. It was a picture, an absolute picture. And so was Sherman's. He was halfway down the corridor when I caught up with him, and he couldn't understand what he was doing there. He was terribly concerned about himself. Anyway, it's an ill wind. Is this our street? Yes, your father's house is just down there on the left. Oh, where are the ambulances? Ambulance? She's right. There is an ambulance. And the police. Now stop here, driver. Very good, sir. Now, Flora... You stay with Uncle Cornelius, and I'll just go and see what's going on, huh? All right, all right, stand back there, please. Come on, move along if you would. There's nothing more to see. What happened, officer? And that's what we're trying to find out, sir. But why the ambulance? Because someone went and got themselves shot, didn't they? Now, come along now, it's all over. But who, officer? Who's been shot? Well, they're bringing him out now, sir. Let us know if he's a friend of yours, won't you? Now, come along now. Stand back, if you please. Let the man breathe a little. Oh, my God. It's... it's Gwent. Gwent? Who's he? Saunderson's butler. What? Well, oh, now you understand yes. why I was hustling you and Flora away from yes, there. Yes. Well, I couldn't say much in front of her. No, no, of course you couldn't. It could have set the whole clockwork orange ticking all over again. My word, yes. It's a rum business, this. <laughs> you can say that again. Well, <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Where's Flora now? Staring out of her bedroom window, waiting for her father, for Sanderson, to come back. Well, it shouldn't be long now. Apparently he went down to the police station to make a formal statement. Those things can drag on for hours. Wonder if Gulliver's heard the news. Does the left hand ever knoweth what the right hand doeth? No, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the British definition of security. <laughs> I'd better go and phone him. You do just that. <laughs> Oh, hello, Flora. Hello, Uncle Cornelius. Go on in. I'll be with you in a second. Just have to make a phone call. Hello, Flora. Hello, Professor. Your daddy not back yet, huh? Well, he came back just now. Oh, good. That'll make you happy. Well, yes, he, he came in a big car. There were two other men with him. Oh? Yes, there were two. Well, they were just policemen, probably. Policemen? Only to look after him. Your daddy's a very important man, you know. Oh, yes. Anyway, let's go tell Mr. Cornelius the good news, huh? <laughs> and then we'll take you home. I'd be most grateful I'll if you would you. tell him that. Bye. Well? He wasn't there. Well, Saunderson's just got back. Oh, damn. Well, I thought I'd just walk her across. Huh? Right, huh? John Cornelius? Uh, Ian Sanderson speaking. Is Flora with you? Oh, yes, she is. Uh, hold on, Curtis. She was um, just about to leave. Uh, well, I, I'd rather she didn't. Um, not just at the moment. The place is in a bit of a shambles. Yes, I imagine it would be. I don't want her to see it like this. It, it might upset her. 
I can understand that. Don't concern yourself about her. Perhaps you'll let us know when you'd like her to come back. Yes, yes, I will. Uh, uh, thank you. Not at all. Uh, uh, by the way... Yes? There are two men on their way over to you now. Policemen. Oh? They want to talk to Flora about the business here this afternoon. Uh, someone broke into my flat, you know, damn near killed my butler. Y yes, so I heard, but Flora knows nothing about it. She was, she was with us all the afternoon. Uh, yes, I told them that, but they insist. Uh, they seem to think Flora was the intended victim, not Gwent. Cornelius. They could very well be right, Mr. Sanderson. They could very well be right. I'll ring you later. Goodbye. Goodbye. That's odd. What is it, John? Sanderson said there's a couple of policemen on their way over to talk to Flora. So? It must be them already. Well, I suppose I'd better let them in. No. What? No, don't let them in. But they're only policemen, Flora. Don't be silly. No, don't let them in. Don't let them in. Oh, keep them out. Keep them out. Well, she's putting the chain on the door, Flora. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill me. John, she means it. Quick, phone Gulliver. Uh, I did. He's not there. Well, we mustn't let those men in. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill now, me. Calm down, Flora. Calm down and concentrate. They're going Now listen, listen to me, Flora. They, they can't kill you if you want them to go away. Now will them to go away. I can't. Make them go away, Flora. I can't. Oh, come on, you can do it if you want to. I can't. I can't. I won't now, go. Flora, try, try. I am trying. Oh, come on, Flora. It's not working. Come on. It's not working. <laughs> They're going to kill me. Get down, Flora. Get down. Now, keep down, Flora. Don't move. Flora. Flora, are, are you all right? Flora. What? Flora's dead. I can't believe it. Such a waste. Yes, John. But now you have to believe that there, there is another controller right here in London. That was part four of Aliens in the Mind, co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius, with Sandra Clark as Flora Keary, Fraser Carr, Ian Sanderson, William Edel, Gulliver, Clifford Norgate, Brigadier Sherman, and Michael Harbour as Gwent. Aliens in the Mind was written by René Basilico from an idea by Robert Holmes. Production by John Dias. Or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com.
Aliens in the Mind. Co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius. Lark and Cornelius have established the existence of another colony of mutants, this time in the heart of London. Flora Keary unwittingly identifies two of them, the brigadier in charge of security at the Home Office, and an MP, Ian Sanderson, who later admits to being Flora's real father. But a new group of mutants surely means another controller, and Lark and Cornelius hope that with Flora's help they can uncover him. Instead, Flora is murdered. No. What? No, don't let them in. But they're only policemen, Flora. Don't be silly. No, don't let them in. Don't let them in. Oh, keep them out. Keep them out. She's putting the chain on the door, Flora. They're going to kill me. They're going to kill now, me. Calm down, Flora. Calm down and concentrate. They're going to kill me. <laughs> Listen, listen to me, Flora. They, they can't kill you if you want them to go away. Now, will them to go away. I can't. Make them go away, Flora. I can't. Oh, come on. You can do it if you want to. I can't. I can't. I won't go. Flora, try, try. I am trying. Oh, come on, Flora. It's not working. Come on. It's not working. They're going to kill me. Get down, Flora. Get down. Now, keep down, Flora. Don't move. Flora. Flora, are, are you all right? Flora, what? Flora's dead. I can't believe it. Such a waste. Yes, John. But now you have to believe that there, there is another controller right here in London. Part 5. Genetic Revelations. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God in his great mercy to take unto himself the soul of our sister Flora, here departed, we therefore commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life, through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Poor Flora. I feel sorry for Sanderson. To discover his daughter one week and bury her the next. If she really was his daughter. Uh, George, uh, Curtis. He's coming over. Uh, oh, thank you both very much for being here. It would have been pretty lonely without you. Well, it was the least we could do. She had no other friends here in London. Not much of a send-off, was it? Just the three of us. It would have been different on Luig. Yes. <laughs> she really belonged to that island. Poor Flora. She didn't even know why she died, did she? Or did she? Well, I... Well, damn it, I've a right to know. And you both know more than you've ever let on. Ian, why don't you come back to my place and have a drink with us? I... I all right. I will. Refill? I, uh, thank you. Curtis? No, thanks. I'm fine for the moment. So it looks as if Flora's murder was not the first. What you're saying is that her mother was murdered too? Yes. I'm afraid so. And you're convinced that the shock of that event was sufficient to uh, unhinge the poor girl? Yes. A and but for that, she would have become aware of her own power over these so-called mutants on Lewick. Yes, that's right. But we know now it's not limited to Lewick. 
Quite a number of them are established here in London. With a controller behind them. An unknown controller, what's more. It seems incredible to me. Are you sure? Really sure of your facts? Positively. Do you know the names of these mutants? Well, uh... Ian, we're looking at one right now. You. Me? You mean... I... We're sorry. Truly sorry. Oh, you're crazy. Out of your minds, both of you. Can you explain why else you would walk into a psychiatrist's consulting room and just lead Flora away? Me? Yes, you knocked him unconscious with your walking cane and, and you manhandled his assistant. And then you just left Flora in the street as if she were a total stranger. It's not true. It's, it's just not possible. I'm afraid it is, Ian. That same psychiatrist was here with us in this very apartment when you did the whole thing over again. We saw you. But I've, I've no recollection of doing any of those things, absolutely none. Mm, that's par for the course. They were actions motivated not by your own thought processes, but by Flora's. That's why you don't remember them. You see, you simply obey them blindly. But why was I the only one? Why didn't any of the other mutants respond to her signals? Well, you were probably the only one within range. We think a mile is a limit this park can carry. At least that's been our experience. I wouldn't mind another scotch now, John. May I? Oh, please, help yourself. Oh, thank you. I feel dirty somehow. It, it's as though my mind had been raped. It's not a nice feeling, not being able to call your mind your own. We had to tell you. Oh, aye, aye, I realise that, but... Well, it's ruined my career, of course. Wiped out everything I'd ever hoped to achieve. Oh, no, that may not necessarily be true, Ian. You see, you are the first mutant to know that he's a mutant. I'm sorry to use that word, but... Oh, there's no other way to put it, is there? No. Uh, go on. Well, now you know what is being done to you, you may at least be aware of the actions you have taken and be able to counter them in some way. It is possible, Ian. Aye, well... I hope you're both right. And it could be of immense value to us. You see, we don't know who your controller is. The one who ordered Flora's death? Yes. And we must uncover him. I don't think we can do that without your help. Aye. I should like to uncover him. I should like that very much indeed. Good. Then let's start by asking if you are really quite sure that Flora was your daughter. Yes. Of course, aren't you? Are you positive Flora didn't put the idea into your head, quite literally? Oh, the thought never crossed my mind. Oh, it's going to take me a little while to grasp the full potential of this phenomenon, I can see. Yes, it is rather frightening, I must admit. Did Flora put the idea into my mind? That's an ingenious idea, Curtis. But no, definitely no. No... I knew Flora Keary was my child before she was even born. It was the reason that I had to stop seeing her mother. I had to let Flora be passed off as Angus Keary's daughter. The people on the island are pretty straight-laced even today, and any sort of scandal would have been enough for them to rescind my scholarship to the university. For who to rescind the scholarship? The Fellowship of the Church in Louis. Uh-huh. <laughs> What's the matter, Curtis? Well, I don't know what you're going to say to this, but... Well, Ian, every member of that fellowship is a mutant. Except the minister. Donald Schooler. Mm. Mm. And for some reason we haven't yet fathomed, he was in cahoots with Molly Kyle, Lewig's controller. Molly Kyle, the controller? Are you sure? Oh, yes. Yeah. She was a great friend of my parents. They were both members of the, the fellowship. Aye. It's snowballing even as we talk about it. Tell us about that scholarship of yours, Ian. Well, it's straightforward enough. It's a, a simple trust set up to pay for the further education of the brighter children on the island. Normally, they're sent away to school in the mainland and then on through university, all expenses paid. Were there many such scholarships? Oh, three or four a year on average. Boys and girls? Aye. Can you remember any of their names? Of course. Do you know who their parents were? Don't you mean, can I remember if their parents were members of the fellowship? Yes, that's exactly what he means, in a roundabout way. Aye, well, I can easily check that up and let you know. Oh, that's excellent. 
Excuse me, I'm just about to see who that is. You know, Ian, I can't help asking myself if all those brighter children who received scholarships were, well, were like you. You mean mutants? Yes. And are they all holding down important jobs, like you? Curtis, are you saying that there is a conspiracy to take over the country? I don't know. I just don't know. That's odd. What is, John? There are two of Gulliver's men at the door. Huh? They want us to accompany them to the Home Office. But who says they're Gulliver's men? Can you be sure? I mean, have you had them checked? Well, their papers are all in order. But they want you to bring your passport with you. My passport? What the hell for? But apparently there have been formal complaints laid against us. What? By who? By a certain member of Parliament. By you, Ian. It is my duty to inform you, Professor Lark, that as a result of formal complaints laid against you, Her Majesty's government regrets that it has no alternative but to invite you to leave the country within 72 hours. What? I must ask you to surrender your passport. It will, of course, be returned to you at your point of departure when you finally leave the country. I must protest, sir. I protest in the strongest possible terms. You are in no position to protest, Mr Cornelius. Your own activities appear to have brought you perilously close to breaking the Official Secrets Act as it is. Official Secrets Act? Not to mention your own code of medical practice. Or do you call it medical ethics these days? Ethics? What what on earth are you talking about, man? In your particular case, Mr Cornelius, I would have thought it unethical in the extreme for a brain surgeon to publicise the name of a patient in the national press, especially when that patient is a senior government official holding a politically sensitive appointment. You can't mean Ian Sanderson. I mean Brigadier Sherman, sir. Who? Oh, you remember, John, that gold-braided blimp who came blundering into Gulliver's office? Oh, him. Well, in that case, sir, I can state without fear of contradiction that Brigadier Sherman is not, repeat not, one of my patients and never has been. That only compounds the situation as far as I can see. But I don't even know the man. Only laid eyes on him once in my life. Oh, forget it, John. Forget it. They've got the drop on us. Your passport, Professor Lark, if you please. All right, there. Take it. Thank you. Here's your receipt. This is preposterous. I warn you, sir, I intend to take this matter to the highest possible authority. I assure you, Mr Cornelius, this matter has already been to the highest possible authority. We've been well and truly set up, John. We've just got a grim and bear it. I don't know whether you gentlemen were hoping to perpetrate some sort of political hoax, but I'm bound to advise you that the allegations you've made against Mr. Ian Sanderson are so vicious as to invite legal action on the most stringent terms. Were they not so outrageous, so impossible as to read like something w- 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 like... Um, Science fiction. Precisely. Not so long ago, they were saying the same thing about getting a man to the moon. I'll get Major Manson to see you out. Yes, sir. Oh, Manson, uh, perhaps you'll be good enough to escort these gentlemen safely out of the building. Certainly, sir. This way, gentlemen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. 72 hours, Professor, that's all. And please be so kind as to advise us of your time and place of departure. Pompous idiot. Cool it, John. You'll burst a blood vessel. Well, I ask you. This way. Colonel Gulliver, like a few words with you. Good. I've got a few choice words I'd like to say to him. Coffee? Strong and black. There you are. Thank you. Cornelius? Same for me, if you please. Sugar? Please. Yes, I'm sorry about all that. So you damn well should be. Thanks. Oh, what else can I do? Once Ian Sanderson's complaint came in, the fat was in the fire. I find it a little surprising, to say the least. This morning I felt sure he was on our side. I think he may well be. He phoned as soon as you'd been picked up. I don't know where he got my name from. From us. 
And he almost certainly heard John say it was your men at the door. Anyway, he told me he hadn't laid a complaint against either of you. He suggested the whole thing was either a mistake or at least a misunderstanding. Well, we still can't afford to take Ian for granted, John. He may want to be on our side, but he's still a mutant. You think he might have been under orders to make that complaint? Almost certainly. The interesting part is that he seems to have pieced it all together when we were picked up and reacted accordingly. Just as you hoped he would. Well, at least it's a hopeful sign. Yes. Now, what about this ridiculous newspaper story, Colonel? That really has put the cat among the pigeons. Yes, I'm sorry about that, too. I'll be lucky if I'm not hauled up before the BMA for that little nonsense. And what about me, being booted out of the country like an enemy alien? <laughs> well, that was something I hadn't foreseen, I must admit. Do I understand you correctly, Colonel? I should think so, Professor. You're nobody's fool. It was you who gave that story to the press? Yes. But why? Quite simply because I happen to believe your story 100%. I also believe that the two men who killed Flora were almost certainly mutants acting under orders. Under whose orders? That's the point, isn't it, Professor? But before I could come to grips with that, I had to deal with another problem much closer to home. Brigadier Sherman? Yes. Sherman is the head of this department. And my immediate superior. And a mutant. Undeniably. And quite possibly acting under orders, even here, in this building. If this investigation was to get anywhere, I had to get rid of the brigadier. I don't see how leaking the story to the press can help. Well, it brings the investigation out into the open, Curtis, oh. into what is called public domain. More than that, it pinpoints Sherman as the key figure in what could be a very embarrassing front-page story. And how have your lords and masters reacted so far to this devious scheme of yours? Brigadier Sherman, even now, is en route for the south of France for a period of indefinite leave pending a full investigation. And I'm in charge of that investigation. Congratulations. And I am to be deported. More congratulations. Relax, Professor. I've already made application for that order to be rescinded. Do I get my passport back? Not until I've completed my inquiries. I'm afraid I just can't allow you to leave the country. And to think Britain used to be called the cradle of democracy. That was Greece, dear boy. Glad to get out of that place. It was beginning to feel like Sing Sing at one stage. Uh, I've never been there, but I think I know the feeling. Ah, hmm. oh, there's a newsstand over the road. Oh, you want to read about what they said uh, about Sherman, huh? No, I want to make sure they've kept my name out of it. Otherwise, we'll be up to our ears and reporters for the next few days. I won't be a minute. Okay. John, look out. John. John, are, are, are you all right? Oh, oh, it's my arm. Is it broken? No, no, I don't think so. Oh, that damn driver could have killed me. Oh, well, that was almost certainly his intention. Oh, you serious, dear boy? You bet I'm serious. Me in America and you in the hospital are worse. No doubt about it, John. Somebody's marked our card. With a vengeance. Oh. Come in. Morning, John. Good morning, Curtis. How's the arm? Oh, it's as well as can be expected, if I might coin a phrase. Well, maybe this will cheer you up, huh? Oh. There, look, there. Four-minute egg, I remembered. Well, <laughs> Coffee, uh, orange juice, toast and marmalade, nice. a lot. Just like Mother used to make. Yeah. Uh, Shall I feed you? Oh, no, 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 thanks. <laughs> I think I can cook. Uh, what have you got there? Oh, uh, this? Mm -hmm. It's from Saunderson. He must have pushed it through the letterbox first thing this morning. It's a list of all those he can remember as having been educated by the Trust. It's an interesting little collection of names. Plus details of parentage, of course. All very comprehensive. Here, um, see for yourself. Mm. Oh, Colonel Gulliver should read this. He may be able to track these people down. Yes, and find out what they're doing now. Mm. I was checking Hughes' observations against these facts that Saunderson has given us. And what did you find? Nothing. Mm -hmm. It's as though I had a key in my hand and couldn't find a lock to fit it. I wonder if I've got the answer. What's that? I couldn't sleep much last night. This wretched arm kept me awake. And the strange thing was... I couldn't get Flora's mother out of my mind. Flora's mother? But mm. why? Huh? Well, according to Flora, her mother was murdered by Molly Kyle because she had begotten Flora in sin, as she put it. Yeah, with the young Ian Sanderson. Yes. 
Well, now, why would Molly Kyle suddenly punish a mutant for something they'd done 13 or 14 years before? Mm, perhaps she'd only just found out. But how? And who could have told her? Only Ian Sanderson and Flora's mother knew the secret. He had left the island and she would never have risked breaking up her marriage. Not after 13 years, certainly. Then the answer must have been Flora herself. Exactly. And when Flora suddenly started developing into a controller... It must have given our Molly one hell of a shock. To put it mildly. And what's more, Molly would have known instantly how it had happened. Yeah. What do you know about Flora's assumed father, Angus Keary? Well, he wasn't a mutant, but his father was. Ah. Oh, where does Sanderson say that? He doesn't. Huh? I marked all the passages in Hugh's notebook that refer to Flora. Here, look, see? Ah, uh ha. -huh. Good. Hmm. Th then what about Flora's mother? Well, just a minute. Let's see. Uh, no, both her parents were mutants. And so were Sanderson's. He told us that himself. All right, so we have a working hypothesis. A controller is born out of the union of two mutants, and the parents of both of them must be mutants too. Oh, we may have to go back even further than that, John. We, we can't be sure. I know, but it's enough to be getting on with, surely. Okay. There are half a dozen names on this list who have two mutant parents. And a lot of their grandparents will be dead by now, so we can't check them out. Exactly. So any one of these could be a controller. John, supposing none of them were controllers? Oh, come on, Curtis. There must be two whole generations here. There has to be at least one controller. If not, where else do we find him? That's the big question, John. And the answer gives me a feeling like hairy-legged spiders crawling over my scalp. As in this country, we call that dandruff. Uh oh <laughs> You know, for a so-called upright Englishman, you spend an awful lot of your time burbling on your backside. Well, I have a poorly arm, and I had to enjoy this delicious breakfast which you prepared for me with such loving care. Well, you finished <laughs> it now, sir. Yes. You've absolutely no excuse for staying in bed any longer. Come on now, get up. All right. And let's right. go over to Saunderson's place. It's important, John. Come on. Uh, can I uh, offer you something? Uh, tea? Uh, coffee? No, Not for me, thank you. I've had breakfast in bed. Well, uh, what is it that brings you here in such a hurry? We want some information from you. About this educational trust. Oh, why? Yeah, where was it administered? On Lug, of course, Curtis, uh, by the fellowship. No, 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 no. That's where the beneficiaries are, where the scholarships are awarded. We want to know where the money is. It can't just be suspended in space. I mean, someone has to be responsible for it, for its investment, for collecting and distributing the interest. If we could find out who does that... We'll be getting much closer to the truth. Aye, well, uh, it, it's administered here in London by a small merchant bank... I should know, because I'm a member of its board of directors. You are? Well, what are we waiting for? Uh, well, uh, if it'll help, I'll, uh, I'll make an appointment for you to meet the bank's chairman. Well, fine. Well, on our way, we might as well drop in at the home office and leave that list of names with Colonel Gulliver. Right. Oh, uh, by the by, yeah? if you'd care to come and look out of the window... Uh, look, uh, down there. See that man in a dark jacket and pinstripe trousers? And what about him? Well, uh, he's been there for two and a half hours. I, I just thought it rather strange. Ah, it might be one of Gulliver's men. On the other hand, it might not. Anyway, if he follows us to the bank, I think we'd be justified in asking him for his account number. If you wouldn't mind waiting in here for a few moments, gentlemen... Sir Graham McCladden has someone with him at the moment, but he ought to be free directly. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Oh, I hate having this floor to ceiling glass all round. Uh, so do I. Makes me feel like a goldfish in a bowl. <laughs> or a germ under a microscope. Oh, really, Curtis, you have an uncanny knack of lowering the tone of any conversation. <laughs> well, it can often be quite beneficial to get back to basics. Oh, dear. You're obviously about to expand another of your extraordinary theories. Oh, wily Uncle Cornelius. Get on with it, then. You know, it just dawned on me that we've been looking at this education trust as something which has developed quite naturally 
out of the situation on Luig. I thought we were all agreed on that. What, from one tiny island? A few hundred simple, hard-working, God-fearing crofters organizing this, this fellowship, this education trust? Oh, it's all too much, John. It's far too much. But what's the alternative? That Luig may have started as an accident of nature, but it has been deliberately built up, exploited, for the sole purpose of producing mutants who can be groomed for high office, like Ian here, or, or Brigadier Sherman. And half the names on Ian's list, I shouldn't be surprised. Right. Y you mean it's been set up like a sort of mutant breeder unit? More like a stud farm. Oh, it's horrible. Yes, especially when you think of Molly Kyle and the Reverend Donald Schoolar as the farmers. Oh, farm managers, more likely. Now, if you're right, then the real villains, the masterminds of this business are hiding behind the facade of this merchant bank. All this plate-glass opulence around us. <clears throat> Excuse me, gentlemen. Sir Graham is free to see you now. If you'd kindly care to step this way. Oh, uh, just a minute. Uh, who was that who just came out? That was Sir Graham's last appointment, sir. The Reverend Donald Schooler. Uh, there he is now, sir. Just going towards the main door. Do you know him by any chance? Oh, yes. We know him all right. And the man he's talking to now. Oh, do you, sir? That's Sir Graham's chauffeur. But he's the man who has been waiting outside my flat for two and a half hours. And sure as hell he wasn't waiting for a bus. That was part five of Aliens in the Mind, co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius, with Fraser Carr as Ian Sanderson, William Edel, Gulliver, James Thomason, Home Office official, and Andrew Sear as Manson. Aliens in the Mind was written by René Basilico from an idea by Robert Holmes. Production by John Dias. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. Aliens in the Mind. Co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius. When Flora Keary is murdered, Lark and Cornelius decide to tell her father, the MP Ian Sanderson, that he is himself a mutant, able to be manipulated by the unidentified controller, the same person who ordered his daughter's death. Shocked and horrified, Sanderson agrees to help them trace the organization back to its source. Their search finally leads them to an educational trust with headquarters at a merchant bank in the city. We've been looking at this education trust as something which has developed quite naturally 
out of the situation on Luig. I thought we were all agreed on that. What, from one tiny island? A few hundred simple, hard-working, God-fearing crofters organizing this, this fellowship, this education trust? But what's the alternative? That Luig may have started as an accident of nature, but it has been deliberately built up exploited for the sole purpose of producing mutants who can be groomed for high office, like Ian here or, or Brigadier Sherman. And half the names on Ian's list, I shouldn't be surprised. Right. Y you mean it's been set up like a sort of mutant breeder unit? More like a stud farm. Oh, it's horrible. Yes, especially when you think of Molly Kyle and the Reverend Donald Schular as the farmers. Oh, farm managers, more likely. Now, if you're right... Then the real villains, the masterminds of this business, are hiding behind the facade of this merchant bank. All this plate glass opulence around us. <clears throat> Excuse me, gentlemen. Sir Graham is free to see you now. Just a minute. Who was that who just came out? That was Sir Graham's last appointment, sir. The Reverend Donald Schooler. There he is now, sir. Just going towards the main door. Do you know him by any chance? Oh, yes. We know him all right. And the man he's talking to now. Oh, do you, sir? That's Sir Graham's chauffeur. But he's the man who's been waiting outside my flat for two and a half hours. And sure as hell he wasn't waiting for a bus. Part six. Final Tribulations. Come in, if you please, gentlemen. Sir Graham will see you now. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, come in, Ian. <laughs> It's nice to see you again. Uh, thank you, You Graham. seem to have been away for ages. Hi, uh, uh, Graham. Uh, may I introduce John Cornelius, the eminent brain surgeon? Mr. Cornelius. It's good of you to see us, Sir Graham. And Professor Curtis Lark. Uh, Professor. Hello, sir. <laughs> nice office you have here, Sir Graham. Must be a good working environment. Perfect. <laughs> but then luxury always is. Yes. <laughs> Won't you sit down, gentlemen? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, what brings two such unlikely visitors through the hallowed portals of a merchant bank? Money. What else, Sir Graham? Well, at least you've come to the right man. We sincerely hope so. Well, tell me all about it. What's your problem? We've just returned from the Isle of Luig. Do you know the Isle of Luig, Sir Graham? Well, of course I do. I was born there. What a coincidence. What? Oh, you mean because of Ian? Not really. Were you also educated on the island, Sir Graham? To start with, of course, but then my family emigrated to Canada. Oh, but that was years and years ago. Uh, Graham, was the Luig Educational Trust in existence in those days? Of course not, Ian. That wasn't until just before the war, uh, 1938 or 9. Hmm. Could you tell us who established the trust? I did. It's always been very much my own private... Um, Benefaction? Uh, yes, something like that. Uh -huh. In gratitude for all the favours received. And in lively expectation of further favours to come. Hmm? Oh, that's a nice turn of phrase you have, Professor. Well, it's not original, I'm afraid. Indeed not. I believe it was her said of King John. Oh, you know everything. <laughs> Sir Graham, do you know anything about the island sickness? Island si What island sickness? On Louis Graham. Oh, that. Oh, that's nothing much. Nothing much. Do you realize that the incidence of mental disorientation in the young is higher on this one tiny island with a population of a few hundred than it is in the rest of the United Kingdom? You call that nothing much, Sir Graham. It's the biggest nothing much I've ever heard of. Put like that, Professor, I might agree it sounds horribly impressive. But as I understand it, this uh, sickness... Is no more than a, a passing phase, like growing pains. Uh, the point is, Graham, that whatever the sickness is, it didn't turn out to be a passing phase with my daughter. Your... I didn't even know you had a daughter. No. I think I'd almost forgotten it myself. Until last week. Why, what happened last week? My daughter was murdered. Murdered? My poor Ian... I had no idea. Oh, but this is awful. Terrible. I can't tell you how appalled I am. Don't you want to know who did it? Hmm? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, of course I do. So do we. It was two complete strangers. Strangers to us, that is. But why, Ian? In God's name, why? We hoped you might hazard a guess, Sir Graham. I don't know why you should think that. Don't you? 
Anyway, the the point is that I'd like to make some sort of lasting memorial to her. Of course you would. What I had in mind was some sort of grant to allow proper research into the causes of this island sickness. On Louis? Where else? It sounds a marvellous idea. We thought you'd like it. And I was wondering if you'd be prepared to let the Trust sponsor it. The Trust? Now, why not, Sir Graham? Isn't the aim of the Trust to improve conditions for the islanders? Uh, well, yes, yes. <laughs> In a way, I suppose. Well, believe me, this would improve their lot. A lot. Oh, uh, excuse me a moment. Yes, Charles? Uh, Lady McClodden has arrived, Sir Graham. Oh, ask her to wait just a few... No, no, no. On second thoughts, ask her to come straight up. Very good, Sir Graham. I hope you don't mind, gentlemen. I'm meant to be taking my wife to lunch. Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. Oh, it's ages since I saw her last. Is your wife also a native of Lewig, Sir Graham? Oh, no, no, no. She was born in Canada, actually. Oh, um... That's where I first met her. But she does take a great interest in affairs on the island. Oh, yes, indeed. she want to know a great deal about this suggestion of yours. Oh, oh I'm sorry, dear. I didn't mean No, to... no, no. It's quite all right, dear. Come on in. Well, if you're sure... You, uh, you know Ian, of course. Of course. <laughs> it's been so long, I'm in danger of forgetting what you look like, Ian. <laughs> now, let me introduce you to Mr John Cornelius, the brain surgeon. Mr Cornelius. How do you do, Lady And McLaughlin? Professor Curtis Lark. You're not Curtis Lark, the author, are you? Well, I do write the odd book or two, ma'am, yes. I've just read one of them. Well, thank you. I'm gratified to find I'm not my only reader. <laughs> no, seriously. I find your predictions of the future use of telepathy and telekinesis quite fascinating. Yes, it is a fascinating subject. And not a little frightening. Oh, forgive me, I've obviously broken up something terribly important. On the contrary, your arrival could be quite opportune. Yes, yeah, sit down, my dear. Here. We hope you might be able to persuade Sir Graham to support our scheme. It's a modest medical research grant. Well, that seems a worthy enough cause. What do you intend to research? Mental illness, Lady McLaughlin. On a tiny Scottish island called Lewig. Lewig? But there's no mental illness on Lewig. Oh, but there is, I assure you. The so-called island sickness is almost approaching an epidemic. They want the Trust to uh, sponsor the idea. Well, if they're serious, why not? It sounds a marvellous idea... That's what your husband said. Exactly what your husband said. Word for word. Uh, of course, we'd have to put it to the other trustees. Oh, I thought it was a private trust. Uh, Graham did say... That he set up the trust? Mm. Oh, he did. As agent for the trustees. Uh, could we approach them? Well, I don't see why not. When? When what? Oh, when could we put it to them? Tonight, if you like. Well, Graham and I are both trustees and the chief executor is dining with us. Three gives a quorum. Well, then you'd better come to dinner. You can put your proposition en masse. Uh, what, all three of us? Why not? The oh. more, the merrier. Well, what a splendid idea. We'd love to come, wouldn't we? Yes, I guess we would at that. I'll make it 8 for 8.30, then. We'll send a car for you. Then you won't have to worry about driving home. That is most awfully kind of you. <laughs> Drink, no, thanks. I want to have that wide-awake feeling all evening. You have a suspicious mind, dear boy. I don't expect it'll be anything but a perfectly ordinary dinner party. Yes, except that we could find ourselves playing footsie with a controller. You think it's McLaren, don't you? Well, I don't know. But it's not a bad position for a controller to be in, now, is it? I mean, head of a merchant bank, finger in every pie, pulling every string. Sounds awfully messy. It sounds terribly legitimate. What better front could a controller have? Well, you're right about that. Every snippet of information in the right hands could be worth a million dollars. Don't you have pounds over here anymore? Oh, yes, yes. But they're not the same as those we used to know and love. How does my bow tie look? Terrible and tired. Why did you buy a clip-on like mine? Oh, that's most uncivilized. Besides, I'd be terrified of you falling into the soup. Well, it might improve the taste. <laughs> now, who on earth is that? Want me to get it? No, 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 no. I'll go. All right, all right. I'm coming. 
Oh, Major Benson. May I come in? Yes, of course. Go straight through to the door. Excuse the smell of camphor. It's Major Manson. Good evening, Professor. Oh, good evening, Major. Will you join me in a drink? Scotch. Straight? A little water, please. Okay. I thought you weren't going to drink tonight, Curtis. Well, I changed my mind. This monkey suit of mine smells so much of mothballs, it's making my eyes water. Hmm. You should give that jacket a good brush. Does that get rid of the smell? No, but it scares the hell, hell out, out of, of the moths. moths. I say, I say, I say. <laughs> <laughs> Never mind us, Major. Here you are, Major. News to you. <laughs> Cheers. Why don't you take the weight off your feet and tell us the news? Well... You've certainly stirred up a hornet's nest. Colonel Gulliver's with the Home Secretary now. Well, I'm glad to see someone's taken us seriously. He's taking the whole show very seriously indeed. Regards it as a full-scale attempt to subvert the government of this country. Yeah, but the question is, who by? Perhaps we'll find out at dinner tonight. Excuse me. Find out what? Who's behind it all? John Cornelius here. Oh, it's Ian Sanderson here. Oh, hello. Hi. I've just seen Sir Graham's car pull up outside your door. But I think the chauffeur's coming to you first, so I'll be down in a couple of minutes. Oh, well, thank you. See you in a few moments, then. Aye, fine. Bye. Bye. That's odd. It's very odd. Something come up, John? No. Well, at least... What? Oh, that was Sanderson. He rang to say McLaren's chauffeur is on his way up for us. Hmm, simple courtesy, surely. Well, I don't know. He, he warned us once before, didn't he, Curtis? Yes, you're right. When Flora got killed. You think he's trying to warn you again? It's possible. Hello. The trouble is, once a mutant, always a mutant. We can never be sure. Here goes. John. Yes? Be ready for anything. Mr. Cornelius, keep your body right behind the front door all the time. Don't worry, I will. What about me? You, Professor, keep clear of this doorway. Okay. Mr. Cornelius? Yes, we won't keep you a minute. Just about ready. Stay out of the way, Professor. Look out, John, he's got a Keep out of the way! John, are you all right? Uh, I, I'm still in one piece, I, I think, but I, I'm shaking like a jelly. Well, that's probably just the reaction. Yes. <laughs> What about him? What about him? Have you ever seen him before? Yes, he was watching Sanderson's apartment this morning. And then we saw him talking to Schooler at the bank. Schooler? Yes. The preacher fellow from your island. Yeah, that's the one. Now, I wonder what brings him to town. Well, that's something else we may learn during dinner. This dinner party, where's it meant to be taking place? Oh, that's, uh, that's a Graham McLudden's. McLudden? Yes. You mean the merchant banker? Is he involved? Oh, boy, and how? Well, his chauffeur certainly was. And you're determined to go through with this uh, dinner? Quite determined. In spite of all that's happened? Because of all that's happened. You know you could be putting your head in the lion's mouth. Well, let's hope it doesn't suffer from halitosis. Oh, I like that, John. <laughs> yeah, you're better. <laughs> uh, do you mind if I use your phone? Oh, help yourself. What are you going to do? You'll require transport, won't you? Where's Sir Graham chauffeur? Oh, what's happened to him? Why don't you tell us? We were actually ready when you phoned. And then we stood around waiting for nearly half an hour. Oh, that's strange. Very. Especially as the car was still parked in the street. I presume it was Sir Graham's car. Oh, I am sure of that. Well, I can't think of any place the chauffeur would go without his car. Perhaps he couldn't take it with him. Oh. The McCluddens won't think it very funny either. I we're already half an hour late as it is. Mr. Ian Sanderson, Mr. John Cornelius, and Professor Curtis Lark. Oh, I thought you were never coming. We very nearly weren't. Well, what happened? Did the car not arrive in time? Uh, oh, no, the car arrived. But the chauffeur didn't. Oh, well, perhaps he ran out of petrol. Now, why couldn't we have thought of that? Let me introduce you to the chief executor. Good evening. Professor. You, Reverend Schooler. Mr. Cornelius. Of course, you know my cousin Donald, don't you? Cousin? I had no idea you were related. Oh, a long way removed, I'm afraid. I'm bound to say I am surprised to see you again, Professor. Yes, I can imagine. Do you think we could all go through to dinner now? I think they're ready to serve.
So what's this nonsense I hear about you wanting the Trust to sponsor some newfangled scheme on the island, Ian? Oh, it's hardly a nonsense, Minister. I want to set up a research grant as a memorial to my daughter. Your da- Oh, aye, Flora. I heard about that. Very distressing, that must have been. More than you can know. Mind, that girl would have been alive today if she had been left with us on the island where she was safe and well cared for. Flora needed treatment, Minister. She was ill. Aye, she had the island sickness. There have been many that had it before you came poking your nose in. And none of them seem any other worse for it. Please, Donald. Mr Cornelius is a guest. It's a fair point, though, my dear. I mean, I suffered from it, and I came through all right. So did Ian. And so did your butler, I believe. Joshua? Yes, I think he did. Also, apparently, the entire fellowship on Louis. What makes you say that? It was the price of the ticket. What? He means that was the reason for joining the fellowship. How do you know that? From the things Flora said, and from what Sanderson has told us. Ian? Yes. And from Hugh Dexter's notebook, of course. What notebook? We found no... No what, Minister? I'm just surprised that anything could have survived that fire at Dr. Dexter's house. It didn't. We had the notebook in our pocket by then. And he told us everything he had discovered before he was so rudely taken from us. Uh, Joshua, serve some more wine, if you please. Very well, my lady. What was it that this uh, Dexter fellow discovered? Uh, Well, he discovered that, owing to some strange genetic mutation of the brain, many of the islanders, myself included, could be controlled the way a robot can be controlled. But anyone with the ability to transmit instructions telepathically. Ian, what's got into you? Ian, listen to me. A man in your position must have and must keep the confidence of the general public. Whatever you believe or think you believe, you cannot afford to talk like that, even in private. I can't afford to be a slave to somebody else's ambitions. A politician must be his own master, Sir Graham. That was extremely well said. Well, I'm only a banker. I may be a bit naive about these things, but... If Ian and others like him have been turned into slaves, who are you accusing of being the masters? Flora Carey, for one. Ian's daughter? Oh, but that's preposterous. Yeah, we keep coming back to that poor wee lassie, don't we? And we're going to keep coming right on back to her. (laughs) She was the only flaw in the pattern, wasn't she? I must say, Professor, this is even more intriguing than your book. And a damn sight more far-fetched. Oh, no, Sir Graham. You see, we've discovered the exact genetic combination that will produce a mutant child. A slave, as you call it. Mm, What we don't know is the exact genetic combination that produces an infant controller, one of your masters. We were hoping one of you would enlighten us. Why us? Well, I suggest you direct that question to someone who breeds thoroughbreds. (laughs) It's not so far removed, Sir Graham. We're talking about another form of selective breeding. Very selective. And to the point of not pairing people who might produce unwanted controllers, like Flora Keary. Only her mother ruined everything by having an affair with Ian. Ah, I've never heard such nonsense. I told you, Graham. It's not nonsense, and you both know it. In the end, it was the reason Flora had to be killed. Wasn't it, Sir Graham? What? You had one controller too many, didn't you? Aye, and now we've got a pair of meddling busybodies. That's enough, Donald. There's no point in abusing our guests. They're intelligent men, after all. They must realise their predicament by now. What predicament? Oh, of course. Curtis, I'm sorry. I should have realised. You should indeed, Mr Cornelius. Aye, with all your fancy training, and you could not work out that it might be another woman. If there's still any doubt in your minds, just watch. Listen to me. Concentrate. Concentrate. Look around you, gentlemen. Ian Sanderson, my husband... The butler. <laughs> Aye, and a whole house full of servants Look besides. Look at them carefully. Don't you notice something strange? Their blank looks. 
Not one of them has a thought in his head except to carry out my instructions. Lady McLudden? Who'd have thought it? Well, you should have done, especially after Flora and my sister. Your sister? Molly Kyle. Molly Kyle was your sister? What were you trying to do, Minister? Keep it in the family? Aye, something like that, Professor. <laughs> and you were just riding on her coattails, power by proxy. <laughs> yeah, it figures. Pity you didn't figure it earlier, then. That was your big mistake, Professor. What do you intend to do with us, Lady McLutton? Well, I have only to will that you should be taken out and killed... And you will be. With a chorus of zombies chanting, kill him, kill him. <laughs> no, they don't have to chant. You can have it in complete silence, if you like. Could we have them praying for our eternal souls, just to keep the minister happy? The time for the wisecracks is well past, Professor. Outside, now. And please, let's not have any unpleasantness. It would be such a pity to ruin such a delightful... An informative evening. Oh, yes, of course, and blood stains are so rough on the carpets. Precisely, Professor. I knew you'd understand. Perhaps you would precede us into the garden, please? Just to the edge of the lawn, if you would. That's far enough. What now? Now we wait for the helicopter. It shouldn't be more than a few minutes. The bank on an air taxi service. Sir Graham often uses it to get him to the airport. Is that where we're going? Yes, Professor. We booked a flight to New York for you. And Cornelius and Sanderson were going to see you off. Were going to see me off? Yes. Unfortunately, the helicopter crashed, killing all the passengers. What about the crew? The pilot's one of my mutants. He'll do what I will him to. You mean he'll just kill himself, like some kamikaze pilot? If I want him to. Ah. Ah, right on time. It's no good looking round, Professor. There's no way out. Nowhere to run to. Even if I did run, Lady McLudden, I've no doubt you could will a whole army of zombies into catching up with me. That's right, Professor. How many zombies do you control, anyway? All right, Lady McLudden, stand quite still. The party's over. Manson. And about time. Kill him. Kill him. Kill careful, Manson. Be careful. Kill She's the controller. Him. Call him off, Lady McLudden. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Call him off. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him. Kill him! Kill him! Kill him. Oh. What? Where what am I? What's been happening? Mr. Cornelius, Professor, uh, you all right? Fine, Manson, fine. You left it rather late. Yes, I'm sorry about that. My wife. My wife. What's happened to her? Caroline is dead, Graham. They have killed her. What? Oh, no. Caroline, my dear. Damn you, Lark. Damn your interfering eyes! Look out, I half expected he would have a gun. Rather hoped he would, actually. What about Lady McLudden? She was unarmed. But why should she bother with the gun when she had a whole army of instant zombies at her command? That's what I was thinking. Well, I suppose that's the end of this business. Is it? Well, except for picking up the pieces on Luig, I mean. Perhaps you'd allow me to look after that. You? Obviously, I can't continue in politics. I'm too big a security risk to ever achieve high office. And that's what it's really all about, isn't Can't it? you stay on the back bench? Oh, no, 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 I don't think so. I'd keep remembering my ambitions. It had hurt too much. No, I'd rather do something useful back home in Luig for a while. Until I can think it over. What about Sir Graham? Poor man, I don't think he understands what's going on. Ah, not surprised. It'll take quite a lot of explaining, believe me. Yes, Ian. And you might be the best person to do it. Hi, I'll try. No, what about you, John? What will you do? Return to surgery before I lose my touch. <laughs> and you, Curtis? Oh, I shouldn't be surprised if I've got quite a lot of travelling to do. What, back to Borneo? All over the place. I don't believe we've seen the end of this business. Oh, surely, Curtis. No, seriously. I mean, Lady McClellan came from Canada. The next controller could come from anywhere on Earth. They could spring up like mushrooms. Oh, no, don't start that again, Curtis, please. Start what? Anything. My dear John, 
I think it started already. That was the final episode of Aliens in the Mind, co-starring Vincent Price as Curtis Lark and Peter Cushing as John Cornelius, with Richard Herndl as Sir Graham McCludden, Joan Benham, Lady McCludden, Fraser Carr, Ian Sanderson, Henry Stamper, Donald Scholar, and Andrew Sear as Manson. Electronic effects for the series were by Chris Jenkins. Aliens in the Mind was written by René Basilico from an idea by Robert Holmes. Production by John Dias. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio